Okay, welcome back to the Cabotiques um, YouTube um, uh, version of our latest podcast. So if you are listening on YouTube, remember um, this uh, is also available via Spotify for the audio. And obviously, if you're listening on Spotify, you can come and look at probably six of the finest looking gentlemen in the detailing industry at the moment on YouTube. Dave's giving me a strange look already. So before I run the intro, um, we've got a fantastic group um, um, of people here to discuss um, you've already seen the thumbnail, regulation in the detailing industry. So uh, we'll go around the room, we'll play the intro, and then um, essentially, folks, the gloves are off on this one. Um, so I highly encourage you to uh, listen or and watch the entire um, podcast um, because Andreas is here. Um, he's back again, podcast number three. Um, so uh, anything could happen. And Dave, um, Dave Reed, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoy the experience as well. So uh, working around the room, Carl, introduce yourself, young man. Yeah, so I'm Carl, one of the TCB moderators and obviously partner in crime with Andy Fraser on the YouTube channel. Fantastic. Steve? I'm um, Mr. Fraser's partner in the car boutique, as we'll probably know, also known as uh, Steve and uh, you can find me geeky detail reviews on other social media platforms thank you steve george i'm george i'm related to absolutely nobody on this podcast i'm a <laughs> tcb mod um <laughs> i say that because andy and carl are suspiciously similar in how they look but anyway um yes yeah, so tcb mod and uh, happy to be here looking forward to getting into the nitty gritty of this podcast happy days I was just thinking, George. Every time we've had Andreas on this uh, on a podcast, you've uh, um, urged to get on it. Is this uh, some kind of bromance going on there, or <laughs> what, what's the, what's the connection between the two of you? That, that would I'm explain the, the the strange messages he sends me. At the <laughs> <laughs> You've been in the DMs. <laughs> yeah. I keep getting messages. When is Andreas coming back on? But I'll leave you to chat offline, um, and um, I don't know. There might be some, uh, some good news oh, coming. <laughs> I'll get a hat. I'll get a hat. Andreas, uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah, I'm Andreas. I'm the most un unimportant member of this um, group and panel here because I'm a regular member of the TCB chat on Facebook. Um, I am a content creator, video creator for the German channel called Detailing School. I'm a Sonex and Ledermax master trainer in Europe. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you very much, Andreas. And um, Mr. Dave Reed. now um, we've got to um, give Dave Reed an applause because um, he has had a very, very busy day. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming along. Um, and so, Dave Reed, uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm Dave. I'm a, a full-time detailer uh, down in Cornwall, uh, unit-based predominantly. And I own and run PVD, and I'm heavily involved with the IDA and the industry trade associations is my thing. Um, and that's why I'm looking forward to talking about regulation. Fantastic, fantastic. So the genesis bit for this podcast is sort of two-tone, really. Um, it, the, the whole subject of regulation has come up predominantly on um, our podcast. And indeed, um, every time we've had Andreas coming on, we <clears throat> dip our toes into regulation, and then we sort of bounce out, out of it again. So we've always, always said that we're going to have a bespoke podcast to discuss uh, discuss regulation. And indeed, uh, most of the TCB crew met um, Dave at UK Detail Academy. I think it might have been a Sphiza day um, where we sort of, um, certainly me and you chatted. We discussed regulation and we thought what a perfect um, sort of combination of people um um myself steve a couple of uh, the moderators andreas and dave so hopefully we're going to have a <clears throat> really juicy about regulation now we're going to split this into two we're going to look at um, regulation of um, detailing professionals okay which we think is important and then really uh, another juicy bit at the end we're going to talk about regulation of actual products themselves in terms of longevity claims and all that kind of stuff now we'll say uh, what you hear and see um, our personal opinions of the individuals themselves i.e um, my opinions don't necessarily re represent tcb as a whole okay so um, that's my caveat on that um, so we'll have a really really juicy um, um, conversation so um, if everyone's happy give me the thumbs up and I'll roll the intro video. Real 
blah blah blah. We'll run the video. I'll edit it in, post edit, and all that kind Hopefully of stuff. Hopefully, you leave it in. I hope he leaves that bit. I'm in. leaving it in. I'm leaving it in. I'm leaving it in. Okay. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask, Dave, yeah. on that mug that you have, is it you on the front of it? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> somebody, <thought> somebody, <laughs> someone sent this to me um, when I was. Hang on, let me show you. Somebody sent this to me uh, when I came out of hospital last year. I was uh, put in hospital for a, for a while. So uh, it's got the IDA PVD logos, my little uh, strap line, which is, hi, it's Dave from South East Cornwall. And then they put a picture of me on the other side. Hey, that's fantastic, that. <laughs> right. So it was a little pick-me-up when I came out of hospital. It was on my, <laughs> on my doorstep. Keep talking. This is podcast gold. Keep talking. Are you going to go down the rabbit hole now of the link with Dave and the mug? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you keep talking. The magic yes, happens. We need, post we need that stuff because it's an episode about regulations. It, it's the most boring stuff ever. That's why. That's exactly. why they invited me in order to. No, no. Me, me and Dave, when we were setting this up, we did say that we need to inject some humor, otherwise, this could be one boring conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we brought George for the comedy value. And you, that's and it. you, and you, also that's... About a, you really need to and think about a clickbaity title for that one. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. George, have you got your um, thing that you usually hold up? Um. With Andreas and you guys. Oh, the plug. Yeah, yeah. Good <laughs> plug, have you? Hang on. On. Go and get it before we start. Have I left? Have I been into it today? You have. Who you have. It? <laughs> One sec. Don't talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's talk about him. Uh, yeah, Steve, like Steve, have you have you seen the the video that Labo Cosmetica did about the Purifica and the other sour shampoos? Not yet, but it's in you my need, watch list. You need to watch it. I'm a massive, massive fan of. You need to watch it. Three pH system was yep. a game changer for me. You, you need you need to watch area. it because they actually were able to show why their stuff works and the others don't. It's it's oh, fascinating. Really? Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I would look forward to that. Thanks, yep. because I say, I've been using that now for around two years. Yep. Um, I've just restocked again on the new 2.0 versions. Yep. Um, so, yeah, no, thanks for that. I'll, I'll definitely have a look. Yeah, have a look. We've been, we've been using that Purifico recently on the last two or three, and then um, the smell, everything about it, really, really nice, really, really yeah. nice. Yeah, and well, that's the only one that works, actually, yeah. at mm. removing minerals. That's, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did right, then, we'll crack on. <laughs> Discale and others. Sorry, did they try it against Discale? Is that what your Discale was in there? Yes, they they didn't name the others uh, which were in there, but I can tell you, Discale was in it. Yeah, perfect. I'll you will see it after. by the color. You will see it by the color which one is Discale. Send me a link, please, or is it just search for? Um, it's online on the Lava Cosmetica channel. Perfect. I'll look, search afterwards. Thank yeah. you. All right, Andy. We've have you finished, you two? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, someone's getting jealous. Hold on. I'm going to need some of this. Bear with me. Oh, Do you know Steve is a professional uh, detailer in Formula One? Anyway. <clears throat> Sorry, Steve. Oh, you're such a bitch, Andy. <laughs> <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Let's go. I was trying to fake a store there, wasn't I? But, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, okay. I thought it was for that okay. Red Bull you were having a stroke. No? <laughs> no. He had a stroke when he's, he watched the invoice for the Swiss Wix order. He... Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're going to get round to Swiss Wix at the end, trust me. Right, okay. <laughs> Mm. Right then, a lesson to the banter. We have got a serious subject to talk about. This isn't. Uh, this is. This is a serious matter. Okay, so we're going to start to talk about regulation. Okay, regulation in the industry, just like any other industry, and um, we're all in agreement that um, an element of regulation is but a good thing. Uh, so, Dave, I'm going to come to you first, if I may. Um, now, a lot of people have heard of UK D Detailing Academy. Um, they've heard of PVD um, uh, uh, and. and uh, 
and all that kind of stuff. They don't really um, understand where it sort of fits in and the evolution of where it's come from. So um, can I just take you back? Um, I've done a bit of research, okay? Um, and um, from what I've read, um, 2012 was really the, ev the, the, the embryonic stage of PVD in terms of it starting at wax stock. Is that, is that really where it started um, or was the work discussions beforehand? Um, you know, who, who, who were you talking to at the time and where did the the um, sort of idea come um, come from because you are yourself a professional detailer um so where, where did that where, where did it start where did the journey start okay yeah yeah so <clears throat> i think the, fir the first thing to say is that i have taken over the day-to-day -day ownership and running of pbd as a uk trade association for professional car care um from from Bert, Bert Yule, um who you'll also know as the editor of the Pro Detailer magazine. Um Bert set up PVD uh in 2012. It was born from an idea and launched at that at that 2012 wax stock uh show. Um the the, the, the in the early days the objective was to bring car care professionals together to help advance the industry it was an opportunity that uh you know there wasn't anything like it in the uk um it was a it was set up as a it was it was set up back then um under a different company um but as is still today it's a not-for-profit trade association it tries to do everything at cost and and you know the money that it makes from its income it goes back to its members um mm. so yeah it was it was an idea that that bert had really um and bert approached me uh probably a couple of years ago now um and said look i'm sort of running out of steam i'm thinking of the future for himself and you know what he's going to do with his life and approached me and said would i be interested in in taking it on um and I, and I think he saw the work that I was doing with the IDA as a volunteer and thought maybe I might be able to make a go of it. So we had some discussions for about probably six months um, and I decided to, to take it on. But yeah, it's been going uh, now 12 years um, since 2012. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's the beginning of trying to put some sort of regulation, some sort of benchmark um some foundation to the industry of professional car care that's that's basically its its objective it's got a few things that run alongside it is an opportunity for um the motoring public to find a uh, you know a, a car care professional that's a member of the trade association to get quotes on on their cars or their vehicles um there's you know obviously discount and benefit structures for, for trade association members but its primary objective is to try and advance for the for the for the better uh, our industry uh, cool. bring people together i'm going to come to steve first and i'll come to An andrea steve you're going to say something yeah just quickly obviously this goes out to youtube so people can actually see it if they sit down and watch us but also for the for the benefit dave if you don't mind obviously on the bottom of your page you've got you know dar which i know uh, what it is and obviously pvd and ida uh, could you just explain those uh, three letter acronyms to people yeah, yeah. <laughs> that are listening to spotify please yeah no good question so dar is my uh, detailing business it's nothing fancy it's uh, old school it's my initials um david allen reed i was uh, i was i was pronounced when i was born um so dar detailing is my detailing business i'm a sole operator um i don't employ anybody i uh, uh, offer a unit-based detailing service mainly correction and coating work um and i also am uh, a mobile detailer but i limit that to the first week of each month and i just go out and do mobile maintenance stuff um so that's dar that's my full-time job that's what where are you based Dave? sorry to interrupt you and step on you where are you based for people that are listening or or watching please? um I'm based in South East Cornwall. Um, so I'm about three miles inland from uh, Lou uh, in Cornwall. And I, I actually moved down to Cornwall at the end of 2016 um, and, and started my business again. I was operating originally in Berkshire 
um, decided I wanted to finish my days in Cornwall and an opportunity came up to sell up and buy a, buy a house here. And I gave all my regular clients away back in Berkshire to other detailers that I knew um, and came down here with <coughs> A, a little bit of a, a little bit of a budget to start some advertising and started again basically thank you so yeah wow. i mean i'm in cornwall that's dar that's what pays my bills that's what earns me my living uh pvd stands for the professional valuators and detailers trade association that's the uk trade association for car care pros that i took on from from bert uh in february of 2023 uh so i'm a year and a bit into running that trade association and the ida stands for the international detailing association which <coughs> is um uh operated out of the us um the majority of the ida's membership is um detailers in america but there are chapters around the globe with uh, different countries having their own membership structure. So uh, I, I'm a part of the UK chapter, um, and that's the next biggest chapter outside of America. Do you have leather jackets, actually, because you're a chapter? <laughs> and aprons, and aprons yeah. and silly handshakes. <laughs> yeah. No, that's brilliant, Dave. Andreas? Um, you said that one of the major goals or one of the, the, the single most important goals of the PVD is to advance the detailing industry. That that implies for me that you saw issues within the industry. And I was wondering what are or, the, or what were those industries? Because when we think back, 2012 is over 10 years ago. So what were the main issues you saw when you founded that organization? Well, <clears throat> some of the issues that we saw back then are still what I would consider to be issues today. Um, so one of the things that both the trade associations are, are, are passionate about, it, they are both PVD and the RDA, is it's about detailers working together for the greater good of the industry. And what we see an awful lot of still, 14 years on, and we, we saw it back then, um was a lot of criticism with competitors you know a lot of egos within the industry and you know one of the things that that we abs both the trade associations are really passionate about working on is is for detailers to work together you know there's enough cars on the road to go around let's work together for the greater good of the industry let's not slag each other off Let's not criticize, you know, help, support, nurture, um, you know, every day is a school day type approach. That's good. I like you, ra it. You, you raise a valid point there um, in terms of, uh, you know, the ego and the, you know, the, the bitching and all that kind of stuff. In certain industries, there's a limited resource. Okay. So there's always going to be comp competition and, and one upmanship. But you raise the valid point that if you look at how many cars are on the road, there are there is enough cars on the road to share that business out um and i, I think that philosophy behind um sort of pvd right one but you know but, but started years and years ago um we're going to come back to the question do, do we think it's got any better um because arguably and you've alluded to it there are still issues at the moment and i'm probably probably return um to that subject but loving the ethos as to why it started um george yeah i was just uh just one for you dave if you uh, sorry, if most uh, manufacturers got together and worked together, as you said before about detailers working together, how much further do you think the industry would be? Because a lot of it is competition now, Try people trying to outdo each other as if they were together. How much further do you think? Well, I, I think it would make a, a big difference. I mean, it, and, and things have progressed, uh, you know, really well, I think, in that in that area. So if you look at the uk detail academy spring barbecue coming up in 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 april uh next month you you know, we, we, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know but the key the key thing i i don't have anything to do with the uk da by the way guys i've i've tr i've done my training there um but you know there are brands and manufacturers that are gonna give up some time to come along there for the day that are competitors i mean we're gonna have 
Flex and Rupes mm -hmm. in the same place. Yeah, you know, that's um that's a good thing. Yeah. And and I think the you know, it's it's a a lot of the American, a lot of the IDA guys that I'm we you know, work with in the in the in America are very very clear about you know staying on their side of the of the road, staying in their own lane, and not worrying about what their competitors doing, and accepting that if they spend too much time worrying about what their competitors doing, they're not you know they're taking their eye off their own business, and and, and it's going south that sort of approach. And, and I think when brands and manufacturers can recognize that there are competitors, but they can work together for the industry, the place will be a much, a much better industry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think it's, I think it, it, it we, we still need to have brands working together closer, but you know, it's work in progress, but I think it will make a big difference. Steve. One thing I was just going to say, and one thing I touched on, on the time frame when you said that this was born and started off, I wanted to know, has it been a negative uh, uh, no, an impact with the likes of the scratch and shines, or has that just taken over from the damage that the automatic car washes, uh, you know, has caused? Has that been a, a benefit or a negative or a positive uh, to what you're trying to do with this association um, of prof trained professionals? So, I, you know, I, I'm of the view that, P PBD is not trying to chase the scratch and shines out of the market. You know, we're not trying to close them all down because we have to accept that there will always be a market for that level of, I, I can't even call it car care, but, you know, car yeah. wash. That's probably a miscave. Know, it could be a positive because of the damage they do cause along with the automatics for a professional. Well, do you think, perhaps? Do you, do you know what? I, I know a... I know a a, a, a detailer that is is not a member of any of the trade associations, but I know a guy in the UK that operates a scratch and shine out of an old disused petrol station, and that's front of house. Behind the scenes, back of house, he offers as a paint correction and ceramic coating service to charge to fix the damage that his guys have caused out the front. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> business model. Yeah. <laughs> ethical yeah. no no but you know I, there are cus there are got uh vehicle owners that just see clean they don't well you know they see yeah. they see partially clean they don't see defects in paint like you know like our eyes mm. do like our brain works so you know they're not interested in you know when i get a customer come into my unit to talk about quoting for a, a job and i've got a, a whiteboard that simulates sort of you know what's the swell mark basically i can tell within the first three well within the first minute whether their eyes glaze over and actually they just want their car valeted um mm. or whether they're really interested in car care and getting the best out of their paint um there's always going to be a market for the scratch and shines um you know the high volume low quality car wash establishments but that's not what the trade associations are about the trade associations are about professional car care um mm. and you know I, I i think the i think the scratch and shines they 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 pop up they some flourish some don't some close up new ones open up but we, we're not really focusing on that it's not it's not the industry mm. that we're in no thanks do you, do you, i suppose go on george Sorry, I was going to say, I suppose, like you touched on before, people just see clean. It doesn't matter about swell marks or anything, and it's time um, that they are thinking. They think, I nip in, it's quick, you know, give them a fiver, and, you know, they get the chamois out that's drier than Gandhi's flip-flop, and all's good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Andy, yes. yes, George. <laughs> <laughs> Might be just around me that they do that, but anyway... <laughs> So Dave, I know, I know you, you. An interesting thing, though, um, when you start regulating any, any industry, um, did you? I mean, you, you, you may have talked to Burr about it, but was was there any sort of inherent um, resistance right at the start? Okay, because we've already alluded to the fact that pre two thousand twelve, there wasn't um, any sort of regulation. There was nothing um, like PVD or anything like that. 
when it first started, was there any resistance in the industry from from any quarters? Um, you know, because I've, I've read that your initial the initial team was only about 30, 30 people, a small cluster of people, um, back in the day. But were was there resistance from people who didn't want the regulation? The reason why I ask is we discussed it with podcasts with Andreas that. Um, there are going to be people when we start talking at the end of this podcast about um, regulation of the products themselves. There are people that will want that. There's also going to be people that don't want it. Did you find that in terms of trying to regulate um, um, sort of the trade professional end or was it fully um, immersive experience for everyone? Everyone's on board. Everyone's sort of the good side. Um uh, be interesting to know what what the, what, um, what the sort of the, the, the fallout from you starting PVD was all about. Yeah, so we we've still got resistance now to it. Um, you know, it, it's not just something that was apparent back then. Um, so to be to be a PVD member, you have to sit a uh, theory assessment, um, which is a, a hundred question theory exam, and we use a invigilated uh, software system um and no one exam is ever the same because it's a hundred questions those hundred questions are pulled for every exam at random from a bank of about 300 questions and once they as a pass or file once they pass that you then take a, a half a day practical assessment with a pvd assessor they all the pvd assessors have had a train the train a day at uh, ukda and there are um, so for new members joining PVD, that's mandatory. That only became mandatory in 2019 um, in, in, in PVD. So we had a whole bunch of existing, long-standing PVD members that had never done that assessment. Mm. We had to pause the practical assessments during COVID because obviously we couldn't do in-person meetings. Um, so So things sort of slid a little bit. But we've got we've still got a i'm pleased to say a relatively small number but we have still got a small number of existing pvd members that have not yet done their theory and practical assessment part of that resistance is you know i've been doing this 30 <laughs> years who's gonna you know who who who's an assessor that's been in the industry 10 years to tell me that i'm doing it yeah. right or wrong yeah. Um, no one can tell me what I'm doing right or wrong because I'm I'm at the top of my game. But PVD's approach is, well, you may have been in the industry 30 years, but things change all the time. Yeah. Products change all the time. Um, Technology is changing all the time. So, you know, every day is a school day. I, I learn something every day. Um, yeah. And the other the other big resistance is, there are, I wouldn't say it's a resistance, a nervousness. There are guys in, and girls in PVD that are nervous about an exam. They've not mm. done an exam since the day they left school. <laughs> um, the thought of a hundred question exam that's timed over 60 minutes and it's a pass or fail fears the life out of them. Mm. Um, mm. But you know, I, I know a guy down here in Cornwall. I mean, we work really well together. We work closely, although he's my closest competitor. He's a PVD member. He is an excellent, excellent detailer. You know, we'll think nothing of, you know, wet sanding and, and polishing back, fully wet sanding and polishing back, you know, uh, a, a 1950s American muscle car, which he does a lot of for a local uh, car restorer and but he's he's dyslexic so the thought of an exam frightens the life out of him um he did it before i took over but you know but gave him some you know there was some adjustments that needed to be made to to help him through what was a you know an overwhelming experience for him he mm. was he was scared of it yeah but you know he dropped out of school he wasn't an academic but as a detailer hands-on he's really really exceptional so you know we have to we have to sort of make adjustments for for, for folks that they're a bit scared of the exam. Do, 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 do people fail, Dave? 
yes. it's not an it's, yeah. so it's not it's not an attendance thing people fail and and that's important because you're upholding that standard aren't you you know what i mean if it's you know if people fail yeah <clears throat> so um everybody that goes through the theory exam has they get two attempts or the, or put another way they get a uh, they get a, get a free reset um if they fail we go through I, I take them through their results and we talk through the the weaker areas um we recommend some or suggest some areas that they might want to go off and get some training in because it's not a training course it's an assessment of their existing skill set mm -hmm. so we we you know give them some suggestions on what, what they might want to go and do some training in and then they can come back and resit that exam um but we want to see evidence of them progressing with their own development through trading they can't mm -hmm. just come back the following day and go i'll have another go but no mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely a pass or fail because you know what we want to do is is create a a baseline entry into the trade association and and, and the industry so mm -hmm. if people don't don't meet the requirements then then they then they're not part of it it's, it's, I'll come to you in a second, Carl. Just uh, I'll come to Carl, then I'll come to Andreas. Um, two, two, two quick points for me. Interesting that the, you mentioned people's resistance to it and sort of suggesting who you to train me. I've been doing it for 20 years. But ultimately, they've approached PVD <clears throat> to be assessed, to reap the benefits of being a PVD member. Okay, You've got an entry requirement, so they, they either go through that process meet your standards pass and and reap the benefits of being having a sort of membership with you or they don't if you if you see what i mean so and mm. it, it's part of that and mm. um, just quickly is there a um so what's the target of people is is it is there a, is there a multi-level process can you do the theory exam and the practical examination can you go to different advanced levels so someone coming to um look at the sort of the index of professional details can is there a grading system um where people could come to or is it just everyone gets passes the benchmark and that's it is there a, a tiering system a sort of different levels that you can work mm. your way up not not yet um okay but that is that is in my thought process for the future um mm. basically you uh, you sit your theory exam first that's uh, 100 questions all multiple choice answers to choose from and it has to be done within 60 minutes and the pass mark is 80 percent if you're a new if you're a new person into the industry that's you know washed your family's cars you know uh, once a month and you're starting out as a full-time detailer valeter you're probably not going to pass it if i'm mm -hmm. honest mm -hmm. uh, it gets the cogs turning in your brain it, you know some of the questions are challenging but if you're in the industry you're working uh with chemicals you understand the ph scale you um, understand a bit about surfaces that you're working with and you know you operate in a professional business using ppe with insurance and all that good stuff you're probably going to be okay but it will get the cogs turning in your head mm -hmm. um, you can only take the practical exam once you've passed the theory so that's that's the there's there's three stages to membership the first is i do they have to send me their insurance i need to make sure they're properly insured not just public liability you know, they've got the full, yeah. full insurance suite i do some checks on their social media and their website to make sure they're using proper terminology using proper safe wash processes um they're operating a professional business <clears throat> once they tick those boxes that i then book them in for their theory once they pass that they do their practical right um, the only other next level is and it's not really a natural progression from being pvd approved but we have nine pvd assessors around the country that are the guys that do the practical assessments for pvd members joining so there's there's myself in in Cornwall and then there's eight others around the country that are PVD assessors. Beautiful. It's it's interesting though. People saying that they've been detailing. Um, I've been, I wouldn't say detailing, washing cars for twenty twenty five years, and I just um, with a few others attended the UKDA um, enthusiast course. Um, and uh, Carl will vouch for it, and, and Steve Steve um, as well. My I came away with my head blown um, <laughs> as to what um you know rich marsh tours and all rich that head. kind of stuff um yeah um well we've done the advantage <laughs> enthusiast didn't we which was 
Um, yeah. More than half a day, classroom based, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, going into, absolutely loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Very I mean, Steve, Steve's, um, Steve's done professional detail. I even think that you came away with a, a few eye opening moments, didn't you, as well? You know, in, in terms I've been of nearly it, so. 30 years in, um, but I'm not arrogant enough to say that I know everything. I had a no. big gap in between my knowledge. So I'm now learning new, you know, new paints, new products, new ways of doing stuff. And mm. um, the, I didn't think that the, the half a day or over half a day in the classroom would have been any beneficial. And if I'd have known that from the start, I might shy away from it. But after mm. sitting it, I was blown away. Massive yeah, I, I love, debate, and it was brilliant. It was. I love that theory bit. Uh, Carl, sorry, uh, Carl, then Andres, yeah. and George. Carl. So, <clears throat> Dave, currently, obviously, you, 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 obviously, the PVD is still growing at the moment. But how many members do you have currently? And, uh, and about, you, go on. Yeah, sorry, go on. I'll, I'll ask the other part of the question when you answer that one. Okay, yeah, about two oh, hours and yes. thirty odd some some uh you know we, there's a bit of movement i I've, I've had three conversations today with you you guys that want to sign up one doesn't tick all the boxes so i asked him to come back and talk to me in about six months time he's a fairly new startup the other two i'm going to put them through their their theory assessment but equally i've had i've had people that you know members that their business is shut or they've retired or they've moved into an employed job rather than so so it moves up and down but about 230. that's fantastic so, what, obviously you, you your pvd and your obviously you got your affiliation with rda and, and you already said that their ethos is well you, the ethos is exactly the same and, and want every detailer to be on the same page friendly work together but what is the end goal for sort of pvd in regards to bringing detailers in and having that training and having that association um well P pvd doesn't offer a training concept um you know the 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 theory and practical process is an assessment of existing skills so pvd work with other you know detailing training providers um you know in in order to help people further their development so you know chris at the sonex um detailing academy uh is a pvd supporter uh richard ian at uk detailing academy etc um you know what what we really want as a trade association is for everybody in professional car care to recognize that actually they they don't want to be the only guy that's not in one or both of the trade associations you know it that it is the place to be in order to in uh, you know further the credibility and the standards in 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 detailing in the industry um, most most professional detailers uh particularly unit-based detailers in the uk that are pvd members you know a lot of pvd members are also ida members and a lot of ida members are also pvd members you know the the two work very well in fact as um as, as andy i think has, has done in his research you know P pvd and the ida started working together much closer than 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 they were previously back in 2016. And in yeah fact, that's, it that's was, my notes say uh, yeah that's good uh, <laughs> <laughs> i've got it all written down oh look at that picture <laughs> and, good right, and you, look Sorry, at, no. you look at the guys there in that photo i mean you got uh, dave kendall who's now at lake country um you got bert you know uh you got um yeah a, a number of people there that are still around in the industry and it was it was that group through bert that set up the ida uk chapter um you know and there's there's an example where you know if if two what is seen as potentially two competing trade associations albeit ones in the uk is a chapter uh but us based the other ones a uk trade show, can work together for the greater good of the industry mm. then surely as detailers we must be able to so yeah, yeah the, the the ida and pvd uh i i i uh like to i'm involved you know massively in both uh mm. and i and i and i think it's good and right and proper that we we work together in the industry i i i, I the more i look into this um you know although i've been detailing washing for years and years I only came you know got into it really 
last two or three years. I wish I was more involved with it back back at the you know the 2012 the first wax stock in Peter. I wish I was part you know involved with that whole evolution. There's some great people there. You mentioned all that kind of stuff. It must have been, um, and I'm coming to Andreas next. It must have been exciting times. You know, you know what I mean. The more the more yeah, you yeah. I research yeah. into it. Um, the whole, you know, the evolution of wax stock from a essentially a, a small warehouse. It looks like in Peterborough to, to where it is now. Um, you know, the whole, uh, you know, how the industry's expanded and how all you guys are all interlinked and everything. Um, really exciting times back then. Um, um, and, and, and you know, I, it would have been lovely to be part of it. <clears throat> I, I picked up. Uh, I, I, I went up to see my father who, who, who wasn't, wasn't well a couple of weeks ago and I swung by Burt's to pick up some old PVD uh, stock basically and, mm. and he had he's got the original um, red piece of plastic uh, that was at the top of the first ever wax stock PVD stand that says professional validators and he said Dave keep that it's not that one is it that I can't quite see it because I'm on my yeah. phone, I'll, but I'll, I'll yeah, edit it in. I, I think I've got the photograph. Oh, cool! Yeah, because he said that that is the one that we had when Mike Brewer came to the stand, and we're like, oh, oh right. we've got to keep that. It's part of yeah, you know, weird, part weird. of the history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't Andrea, know sorry, Andreas has ever heard of Mike Brewer, has he? <laughs> oh, there you um, That's him, isn't it? In in regards to what you said um that some of your members have res have a resistance towards the the test studio um, i don't know how how it is in the uk but in in uh, let's say central europe there are developments to change the schooling systems to go away from tests and testing um, because some people say it's not a good measurement of a child's intelligence or willingness to learn. So um, in regards to that, do you think that doing a theory and a practical test is the right measurement of, an, of a detailer's ability? And or are, there, are you thinking about changing that maybe in the future? Well, I... The best we're way getting juicy now. That. We're warming up. Yeah, we're yeah. warming up. Not uh, yet. Not yet. I have another one. <laughs> I, I, I think the way that the questions are drafted in the PVD theory exam really does get the cogs turning in your head, and I personally think it's the right the right way to do it. And I, I tell you what, I'd like to do, Andreas, is why don't you and I set up for you to take the PVD theory exam, because I yes. really value That's actually your a question I wanted to make, not only me, but the whole panel um, of the yes. podcast. Let's do it, guys. Why I would love do that to do and it. have a, a second podcast in which we then discuss first our results, which will be a, a surprise for all of us. And yep. maybe our experiences <laughs> with the test. Yes, why not? I, I Dave, Dave, you might find, Dave, you might find a hundred pound trans your account very shortly okay <laughs> i think that's i i'm i'm in, i'm intrigued i'm intrigued to take this test um i think let's, that's let's set it up guys i think it's good yeah that's you good. know um greg great idea greg, andres who's the um md at valet pro he took his pvd assessment his theory and his practical um uh, partly as a a bit of pr but partly mm -hmm. because or predominantly because you know, before he set up Valet Pro, he was a he was in car care. He was a valeter, a, a detailer, and he said, "It's been so long since I've been in the industry at the sort of you know front end. Mm. I would like to see how things have changed, and I want to see how recent I am or not in processes. I want to take my PBD theory and practical." Uh, mm. He passed both. Um, but you know he he really enjoyed that process. Let let's set it up, guys. I think I that. think you're that. yes. I yes, think absolutely. you'll really enjoy it. And if you you know if you do do it, I'd really really value all of your feedback on that process. Absolutely, because that's say, how it, we all learn and develop and grow. The secondary gain of what Andrea said, and I think that's a blinding idea, is I've I've been an in, um, a technical instructor and leadership instructor for about 15 years. Carl is a 
technical instructor um, at the moment. Andreas is heavily, yeah, Andreas is he heavily involved with a uh, university academia. Um, I, I believe you're still providing yeah. your support to students and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. um, it's 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 that question about the correct medium or the correct um, format for assessing knowledge and everything is a really great question. But I am so up for ta taking this test. It's unbelievable. Um, I'm probably going to go at 30%, but I am merely an enthusiast. There's, there's my breakout caveat, Carl. So I'm going to throw this sort of backwards towards Andreas, actually, because yeah. obviously with being me and Andy also being uh, instructors, we, we assess our students on their, their knowledge fire exam based. How is how is sort of Central Europe looking at changing that written exam basis and what to? They don't yet have concrete ideas, I think. So how would you they're, they're how would you assess talks, someone's knowledge? There, there's just talks yet about so it's it's quite typical, right? They see a problem, they think that that a test and doing tests written or oral are not the correct way of doing it but no one has an idea of how to do it better that's that's the current state i guess all this all circles around if you were to own it doesn't matter what car you were you know you were to own but from an insurance purposes point of view if you were to allow somebody to come in your house and change your boiler you would want to make sure they're accredited one because it could kill you yes i know but on the flip side just imagine your vehicles it's the second most expensive thing you own um, and you're going to let somebody who could have started up only two months ago go and pick up five litres of truck wash and leave it on in the sun on a black mm. car. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah that's a good, you know, so that's a good I point think there is, and that's what we're talking about this, isn't it? There has mm. to be some sort of regulation because of the chemicals. Mm. But we will move on, as we know, to the product part of it and how honest or whether they actually supply the you know, yeah. multi, uh, material safety data, you know, data sheet. So, George, and then I'll come back. Sorry, Steve. Um, sorry, well, Steve, you haven't finished. My apologies. Uh, come to George, and I'm come back to Andreas because um, he did say there's a part two to his question. I'm intrigued, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, regarding towards the exam, um, I suppose for like Andy and Andreas and Steve that have been doing it a lot longer than say Carl and me, how long would you say you've got to be in the industry before you'd attempt the exam? Because obviously, you get massive variance in cars and paints and everything because like you were saying about the wet sanding on a i think you said it was a, a american muscle car didn't you um because like mm -hmm. some people might never have touched one or yeah so sorry i'll, I'll put it to you that way then so it, it's worth before i answer that it's worth um bearing in mind that the pvd assessment process is an entry level baseline into the unit uh, into the uh, industry there there's no there's no machine polishing on the practical paint correction okay. there's no uh, application of ceramic coatings on the practical it's it's a baseline you know into the industry at, at the mm. beginning of what could be regulation so you know there's there's um there's on, on the theory, there's questions that in, in, include knowledge about ceramic coatings, or certainly at a basic level. Um, and on the practical, there's um, you know, flashcards where you know, candidates will be asked to point out what, what are certain defects in paint, from you know, swell marks to stone chips to bird etching, etc. Um, but the the PVD requirement is that it you, it the, the detailing your detailing business needs to be your primary income okay um so we're not saying you've got to be full time but mm. it's preferred um but it needs to be your primary income and you need to be uh running your detailing business for a minimum of 12 months okay. that's the current pvd uh sort of precursor if you like now mm. you know i the, the, the conversation I had with a with a young lad today, he's he's uh, about four months in. I said, look, you need to come back and have a conversation with me in a, in a, in a bit. Um, if somebody's at eleven months and two days, and they and and I, you know you have a chat with them, you get a feel for what they're all about. You look at their business on social media, you think, well, let's run them through the exam. Let's put them through it and see how they get on. 
Mm. You know, because <laughs> I, I know guys that were that have you know would struggle with the exam that have been in this industry at a very, very high level for thirty odd years and what their knowledge of paint and protection options, you know, isn't isn't worth you know anything what they what 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 they don't know is just not worth mm. you know, they're just top of their game mm. but mm. they employ somebody to do the decontamination of the car and they've not actually they've not actually <laughs> washed the car for 20 years yeah, yeah. so yeah. they yeah. they probably although they're operating at an extremely high level in the industry in terms of the cars that they're working on the the the, the, the offering that the, the service offering they're they're offering their customers they don't wash cars because mm. they employ someone to do that. Mm. So, you know, the, the, their knowledge of the pH scale and understanding that a low pH is an acid and a high pH is an alkaline, they haven't looked at that for 30 years. I'm going to, I'm going to put Carl on the spot. He did a detailing course recently. What does pH stand for, Carl? Oh, no. He's good. He's good. Hydrogen. Is he right, Steve? I thought it was sure hydrogens myself, but they you muted Steve. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I've got noise on in the background. Um, sorry, hydrogen, yeah, pa potential is hydrogen. No, potential hydrogen. Potential is, is it? I thought it was potential hydrogen. I think it's actually not precisely defined because there are differing definitions of it, but it has to do with potential. with the hydrogen. Potential hydrogen. hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the P stand for, Dave? Do you know, I'm learning every day. I think some uh, say power, some out. say potential. It's, it's yeah, either, either one yeah. of those. Right, How okay, I'm going to I'm, I'm edit but, that out because I've made myself look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the thing oh, that Dave just can. said is the, the perfect timing for, for the second part of my question. Um, you, you said you are trying to further the the industry and further the the standards of the industry um by trying to get every single detailer on board on either one of the organizations you have um looking at the situation now that not every detailer is part of either one of the organizations don't you think that someone who is very critical about the organizations could say you're actually not furthering the industry because you're you're creating like a separation of the the market and the the detailers where you say there are two classes of detailers the one which are accredited good ones the ones which are not accredited the bad ones even if there could be a situation in in in, in which an uncredited detailer actually does good work yeah I, and you know i I would love to, I would love to see every detailer in both of the trade associations in the UK because the trade associations and you know all my work within them is is what I'm about you know yeah. I, I believe in it but I also accept and both both the IDA and PVD acknowledge that being a member of the trade association for car care is not for everybody and if somebody doesn't want to be part of it, we're not going to treat them any differently. Our our code of ethics, if you like, of working together still applies, whether they're a member of a trade association or not. So, you know, I know I've got a lot of, you know, friends in the industry that are not in either the IDA or, the, or PVD, but are still engaged and I still work together with them. Um, mm -hmm because i i get that it's not for everybody mm. you know and, and that's absolutely fine i i really don't want to create that two class system i want i want there to be one one yeah, class and it's about detailers working together yeah i see there's regulation in every other part you know especially in construction like i am as my my day job you know you, you can't breathe or you can't even enter a site without you know having a certain accreditation you can't pick up a piece of machinery without having an accreditation you know and from i'm so it, it does amaze me how we haven't had that standardized you know standardized across you know and the, how easy it is to go and pick up something yeah. and then and, touch something that's you know ridiculously expensive 
And and you know, Steve, the, the the point that you made earlier about you know somebody coming into your home to service your boiler, I I'm of the view that you can get your boiler serviced by somebody that's gas safe, and you're going to get a bill of sale, and you're going to get some sort of warranty and backup with it, and you're going to get an invoice, and it's going to be done to a professional standard that's safe. Yeah. Uh, but I also know you can get your boiler serviced by gym down the pub for 50 quid cash in hand no questions asked and no. you take the risk there will always always be a market for somebody that wants gym yes i get that yeah. i get that we're never going to stop that you know but but what what i would like to do is be part of that journey to you know offer the motoring public the choice of going with you know a scratch and shine or mm. somebody that's professional in their car care business First, mm. just sorry to jump in there. Let's. What is the cost then? Because let's let's iron out the cost. Is it a cost issue? Is it expensive, or not no, to join no. DVD or IDA? No, it's not a cost issue. I don't believe because it's uh, it, it is relatively cheap. It's um, so for so, but both PVD and IDA are set up as not for profits. Um, PVD is um, the assessment process is done. Uh, pretty much at cost, um, the theory exam um, and the practical assessment, and that for a new member joining is £299. Um, that's a new price, actually. I, I've just put that up uh, because we were doing it at a loss because I pay the PVD assessors for half a day's work of carrying out the assessment. Um, uh, so that's £299. Uh, that's a one-off cost, and then your PVD membership is only nine pounds ninety nine a month, or a hundred quid a year if you pay up front. Mm -hmm. um, IDA is structured slightly differently. IDA is a hundred and twenty dollars. Um, it is well, it's hundred and ten dollars, but it's going up uh, on the first of April to a hundred and twenty dollars uh, per year for your membership. Um, your uh, the IDA's equivalent of the PVD theory and practical assessment um, is called Certified Detailer and Skills Validated. IDA Certified Detailer exams and the Skills Validated exam is optional. Um, you know, so the bar to entry into PVD is quite a bit higher because it's mandatory to take the theory and practical assessment. The equivalent of the PVD theory in the IDA, which is the Certified Detailer Exams, you pay uh, $200 and you uh, buy the exam pack and take them online. Um, and if you want to then go on and do your practical assessment with IDA, which is called Skills Validation, um, that's another $200 and you do it in person. So if I was to take my exam, Dave, um, yeah, just to throw it out there, I then pass. Do you have uh, insurance companies linked with yourself that recognize the training course that you offer to give me a discount on my insurance? Yeah, yeah. Policy? That's, that's a really good question, Steve. So, um, yes, um, we've, we've got two PVD supporters that are insurance companies. One's Covershaw and one's um, Kingfisher Motor Trade that uh, used to be known as Classic Insurance Services. Um, uh, Covershaw um, will cover you predominantly if you're a mobile detailer, uh, classic slash Kingfisher if you're uh, unit based and you've got commercial premises. If you take out a policy with classic insurance, um, now under the Kingfisher uh, group, they will pay, and you're not a PVD member, they will pay for your PVD assessment. The following year, if you renew, they will give you a 10% discount. If you are an existing PVD member and you take out a policy with Classic, they will automatically give you a 10% discount. So, you know, most people that are, most detailers that are unit based, their premiums, they obviously vary by size of business and location, but are somewhere between 2,700 and 3,700 pounds a year. So when you can get 10% off, let's say three grand, 3,000. If you can get 10% off by being a PVD member, you save 300 pounds. You Your membership for PVD is only 100 pounds a year. 
There you go. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. So you're making a right. 200 pound profit by being a member of the trade association. So it's not a cost issue. Yeah, no, that's good. Thanks, great, Dave. great Thanks, question. Great question, Steve. Uh, Andreas. Yeah, um, speaking about money, I mean that's what, when you're when you're part of a lot of Facebook groups and in which uh, people talk about PVD or IDA memberships. There's always from the critics. There's always one question that comes up: What happens with the money? Um, and especially then the follow-up question: Does anyone get within the PVD or IDA paid, and how much maybe they get paid? That's that's always the same question: What? happens yeah, with yeah. my money yeah so let let me let me tell you what happens with the money in pvd uh because i i'm in control of that so <laughs> the money the money in pvd uh, that's an awfully big money. house you're living in there dave yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking i'm joking you in the west uh, Dave. Uh, <laughs> that was that that is nothing to do with PVD. That was the benefit of selling a house in Berkshire and buying a house in Cornwall. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, plus yeah. that that's coming from a man with, with the Swiss works bag in the background. So yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, Can I just no, ask one Why have Go you on. got a Swiss wax bag on the top shelf but vinegar behind your shoulder on the other side? There. There. Down. No, that's baby oil. That's for later. Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> what golden syrup? <laughs> oh, yeah, how hydrophobic uh, is it? Him and Carl wrestling later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, <laughs> where, where, where where to Andreas's question about the money. Um, yeah, sorry, what, Dave. Yeah. What, yeah. Um, no, I think it's a very, very good question. It's important to mm. sort of try and get across. So, uh, it's a PVD and the ideas are not for profit. Um, so that so the um, income from PVD is twofold or threefold. Um, the first is the first sort of revenue stream, if you like, is through PVD members' subscriptions. The second is through uh, car care brands, uh, uh, tooling manufacturers, and supporters that pay a supportership fee into PVD each year. And the third is the costs of the PVD assessment process. Um, the all of the all of the money that comes into PVD goes back into the the members through uh, the costs of setting up members packs. Um, you know, well, new new members welcome packs. Uh, you know, PVD branded flyers and T-shirts and mugs and all that sort of stuff that we give away at waxed off and, and what have you. Um, and the assessment costs, um, I we used to pay our PVD assessors um, £75 to carry out a PVD practical assessment. Now, I... For I half a day at once, right? For half a day's work, yeah. yeah. It's a three-hour practical assessment, but by the time the, 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 the assessor sets up and breaks down at the end of it, it's half a day. I was very, very conscious that, uh, and maybe it's because you know I'm also a detailer, whereas Bert wasn't. I'm conscious that if that detailer, who's a PVD assessor, books in a normal paying customer for half a day's work, yeah, they're going to be earning a lot more. And I, yeah. I really, these guys are giving to the industry their time to try and get people through their PVD assessment. I want to make sure they're fairly fairly recompensed so um the old pvd assessment price for a new member was 175 pounds 75 pounds went to the pvd assessor for the practical assessment the remaining 100 pounds 25 pounds stayed in the pvd kitty and that covered my time for doing the one hour practical uh, theory assessment with them uh, online and the other seventy-five pounds that was left funded the cost of the welcome pack. I've increased that from one seven five to two nine nine because we were operating at a loss. Yeah, because the welcome pack now costs us about one hundred and twenty pounds to to create yeah. with the yeah. t-shirt and the bag and all that stickers. So, so uh, what? One of the things I wanted to do was fairly recompense the PVD assessors for half a day's work. So I. 
uh, I've now increased that from seventy-five pounds to one hundred and fifty pounds. I've doubled what they're getting, but I still think one hundred and fifty pounds for half a day's work as an assessor is is good value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Is 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 any of that calculations or maybe the the accounting is any of that? publicly available within the PVD or IDA because that's that that would be my suggestion to to both organizations to like yeah yeah how so, to act is these criticisms that may, mm. maybe if, if the accounting is is publicly available and everybody can see where the money is going then there, there would be no need for for accusations in in that respect I, I think um, so. The the, P, the PVD accounts are so PVD is a limited company, so it's available on the UK Companies House website okay. in terms of all the accounts. Um, but it's a it's limited by guarantee, um, not by shares, which is what makes it a not for profit. Um, the IDA, I think, the IDA share their um, end of year sort of business results at the. IDA award ceremony at Mobile Tech Expo okay, each year, but I I think that's a really good point, and I will take that because I sit um, on the global board for the IDA uh, along with Craig from from the UK and, and a load of other guys from around the world. I will take that to the UK board because I think that's a really valid point, um, and and I think you know that's also a not for profit. Nobody's creaming it off the top. Nobody in the IDA gets paid anything for any of their time um for everything that they do you know they they do it for free genuinely because they want to you know try and give back to the industry yeah. and i think it, it'd be helpful to to get that out to the to the detailing community Abs absolutely absolutely great, great question andrew Dreyas. did i see right i might have got this wrong when i was doing my um research as they say um did you donate to help for heroes years ago was that pvd or I'm pretty sure I, I was seeing something in in my research that said there was a um, he was supporting a charity and some money went to help for that heroes. Is that correct? Andy, that was the first pro detailer magazine when they sold. Ah, the that's right. And all the profits from the very first magazine went to help the heroes. <coughs> well Did done. My research well done, as well. Absolutely. I, I I was just giving you an opportunity to excel, Carl, and you've grasped that <laughs> really, really, really well there. So. Carl, Carl's also been doing his research. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's, that's just, because just we just a few notes here. That's because yesterday I said I suggest you read up on this stuff. <laughs> no, really, really, that, really good questions, and and I think um, Andres's questions are born of the fact that we see these questions, we see these exactly um, yeah, yeah. People, on social media. So let's grasp that opportunity to ask those questions while we've got Dave's attention and um, um, a very open, honest results uh, um, um, responses, Dave. So I really appreciate that. Um, so has anyone got any questions? We're going to we're going to take a super quick break, and then we're we'll going to get on to um the, the well, one thing i will do before we go on to um unless anyone's got any pertinent questions before we start talking about um the products themselves and um um if if, if i was a professional detailer i've um just started i've been in my business you know for 12 months i satisfy all the entry criteria um in a nutshell and this is where you get to sell it dave what it what is and this will almost justify paying money for it what are the benefits to me um if i wanted to go professional detailer what are the benefits of joining apart from having you know i'm pvd and all that kind of stuff are there any tangible benefits to becoming a member of either pvd or the ida yeah i think for, for both so um rather than taking up loads of time talking about all the individual benefits of both trade mm. associations i'll try and sort of summarize it um you know with any trade association you really get out what you put in that's the, the principle of, of both um but you know in pvd we get somewhere between um 45 and 70 quick quotes come through the website for the motoring public to uh ask pvd members to quote on work uh 45 to okay. sort of 70 quick quotes a month um for all of the people you know all, all all around the country um so that is one benefit of being in in the trade association but not the primary benefit don't join the trade association if you think you're just going to get a load of work out of it um you you will probably get you know a work out of it that will cover 
at least cover your membership fees, if not a lot more. But don't join if you think that's just the benefit, the only benefit. Um, there are, I guess, like you know, like TCB, um, you've linked up with suppliers and manufacturers. Um, the PVD um, partners, the PVD supporting companies, offer uh, PVD members discounts um, that will save their membership fee. You know, probably tenfold over the year. Uh, a bit like the deal with Classic Insurance, where actually, you know, members can make a profit out of it almost. Um, there is, uh, you know, the whole, you, you can use the logo on your website, your social media, uh, but but most importantly, what it shows both with the IDA and the, with PVD that to your customers, you know, a lot of detailers uh, put their work on social media and, and actually the majority of likes and loves are from other detailers. That's not their market. Their market is the customer, yeah. the motoring public. And, you know, the motoring public that are serious about car care can, can, can be, uh, you know, rest easy knowing that their pride and joy, because that's the market mm. we're in, their pride and joy is in safe hands with somebody that is invested in their own professional development mm. in the car care industry, whether that's PVD and or IDA. You know, linking onto that linking into this and this is this is a question that's right up andreas's street so um i'm, I'm thinking about joining okay i've passed what what quality control measures are in place to ensure that your members maintain the professional standards of pvd and ida i.e could you could i um you know um pass the exam and really go for it on the practical assessment just to get the kudos um uh, the use of PV, you know pvd ida membership how is there any uh, follow-up is there a feedback system whereby customers feedback um performance and and and, and uh, you know how good they were at running the business all that kind of stuff can people get kicked out um yeah, yeah. And, yeah is the because I, I think that's just as important because you can get um loads and loads of people in other industries that tick all the boxes and you know um, um get get memberships and all that kind of stuff and then their their standards start dr dropping how do you maintain the ongoing performance and standards assurance if your members um from start to you know start to finish um yeah no very very good question that so um so uh, the, the the first the first thing is that there is a review system built into the pvd uh website so each pvd member has got uh their own business's profile on there and customers can leave reviews on there um if reviews uh, reviews get, come through to me before they go public um mm -hmm. and if they're if they're good i just hit send and it goes on their page if they're not good, then I'll pick up the phone to that PVD member and have a conversation with them because there's two sides to every story. But yes. um, that's yeah. the first thing. The second thing is that there is a formal procedure um, where customers can come through to me as a, you know, as a as an independent within PVD, um, independent in that I, I, I will listen to their, you know, issue and then have a conversation with the PVD member uh, and, and sort of, you know, be a, be a middleman, if you like, between mm. the two. So well, there's a dispute much. resolution. Yeah, yeah, there was a dispute mm. resolution process. Um, and, you know, in the past, there have been PVD members that have been ejected. Um, mm. <clears throat> there have been, um, you know, there, 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 I mean, I'm not going to name names, but there was a PVD mm. member about, um I think it was about six years ago and strangely enough it was in my old area um not in cornwall uh, when i was in Berkshire. Mm. that was removed from pvd because he was physically ass uh, he, he assaulted somebody mm. um not not a customer but uh, a, a passerby a member yeah. of the public and we said and, uh, that is mm. not the behavior we want in a professional trade association and ultimately um, your members your members are the ambassadors if you want to put if you want to use the word brand you know you, all your pvd members going out there working are, are ambassadors for the pvd ida name so that that that's it that's important isn't it yeah and mm. and often you know when i'm um i mean it's not and this isn't uh 
a, a big quality control measure. But you know, often when I'm travelling, um, I will I will stop in at PVD members unannounced, um, yeah. just for a coffee, and it gives me a chance to observe things and see what's going on with my own eyes. Mm. That perhaps the way in which they presented themselves and mm. their processes in an exam environment are perhaps you know a bit different in the yeah. world and you know we have a conversation i like that i like that big brother is always watching <laughs> <laughs> so folks we're about halfway through this podcast what are your thoughts so far what are your thoughts on what you've been hearing and what are your thoughts on detailing regulation now the panel welcome you to leave a, a comment in the video comments block and we will endeavor to get back to you essentially continuing this very very important conversation so get yourself a brew and we're just about to start part two which is looking at regulation of the detailing products themselves okay so part two um we've we've discussed um, um regulation um in terms of our detailing professionals we've looked at the pros cons and we've asked some um really really quite deep questions um um, and Dave has given us brilliant, honest answers, yeah. giving us an insight into the the ethos, the the concept, and the ideology of what PVD and RDA are all about. So that is great. We're going to dive a bit deeper, and not necessarily into in Dave's um, sort of area of expertise. But Dave, I'd really, really want to capture your opinion on this as well. Um, Andreas is standing by, as we all are. We're now going to look at regulation of the products themselves. Now, um, for those of you who've listened to the podcast previously, we, like I said, right at the start, we step into this. Um, and so the next sort of mini section is going to be about how we regulate the products themselves in terms of product claims. Um, and myself, Carl, um, Steve, George, we, we, we review stuff, okay? And part of that review is looking at user experience, our personal feelings and emotions. But let's face it, um, I've started to do a bit more, Andreas does it, Steve definitely does it on the Geeky, is we we test the claims of these brands, okay, in terms of longevity and all that kind of stuff. So the next part of the discussion, the gloves are off because we are in a beautiful position whereby none of us represent a detailing brand. We don't sell detailing stuff. So this will be an um, interesting conversation. And I want this conversation to, um, on the whole podcast, to carry on in the comments, okay? We are instigating a discussion on regulation um, and we would welcome your comments um, and join in this conversation um, after the podcast is published. So, detailing products. Um, we've all, I've, caught, I've been caught short of it. Um, and longevity claims is the, is the big one that I've started to steer away from because I haven't got myself into trouble. But I've done a review and I've said that the longevity of wax is, I don't know, two months. And I've had messages from the brand saying, well, actually, it's six months and all that kind of stuff. How do we as a panel think we should start regulating the claims um, and and what what format would that regulation take? Has there got to be a benchmark testing process for uh, for products? What are our thoughts? Straight to you, <coughs> Dave. My initial thought on as soon as you mentioned that, uh, my initial thought is if we think about ceramic um as 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 a product in our industry i think we should start moving away from stating years in terms of durability yeah um okay. you know I, I so my in my detailing business i i'm accredited by two brands um i use garage therapy and labo cosmetica um in fact i was on the first ever uk labo course with John at Clean and Shiny through Reggie uh, and uh, been using Labo uh, ever since and then more recently a couple of years ago GT. Um, one of the things that Labo do is they talk about durability claims in terms of uh, kilometers um, rather than you know, years. I do not mention to any of my customers this is a one-year coating, three-year coating, five-year coating because there are so many variables and so many environmental challenges that can just knock that out of the park you know yeah. a car that um is a daily driver that is kept outside that is parked on the trees there is no way on this planet a coating is going to have the same durability yeah. as a car that is a weekend pleasure car that sits in the garage throughout winter 
uh, you know, you, you know all the variables. We all, yeah. we all know the story. So, you know, to say that something's got a three-year coating, it's going to be different on car A to car B. I, I put a coating on a car. I'm not going to tell you which one. I put a coating on a car, funny enough, that I handed back to the customer today um, that I've just repolished and recoated. Um because he's had some he's had the roof repainted and the, and the, and the bonnet repainted <clears throat> but i've polished and recoated the whole car um the coating on the roof i i prepped the car i i, I would say i prepped the car properly the way i would any any car the coating on the roof failed after four months um, on all the other panels, it was fine. I did all the decon processes. You know, we talked earlier about Purifica as a as a product. You know, I went through all the um, coating, uh, unclogging, coating, decon. Dave, can I just stop you there? I'll, I'll edit this in. Has someone got a dog or something? I'm he hearing a noise, like a woo. Is oh. it just me? I keep I'm, I'm hearing a noise that's coming it's through. Snoring, isn't it? Sorry. No, I can hear it. No. no. Can you hear it, George? George, what's so funny? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some snoring noise? going on. Right. It's, it's, the snoring. Snoring. it's the snoring. It's the snoring noise. What is that noise? Yeah. If it's snoring, that'll be my bulldog under my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picking, I'm, Steve, I'm picking it up on the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try it. It keeps coming through now and again, but dead loud, and I'm like, Right, it's gone. I like, it was coming it. through my speakers, and all I could hear was. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it's my ball okay, yeah. under my feet. I will mute my myself in the tool and keep giving her a, a swift little dig. Sat, no, no. Right, oh. okay. So, Dave, you've got to remember roughly where you were. So, I think you were just talking about. Let's go for. Um, and it failed after four four months. Okay, I'll right. edit it in. Um, so, uh, back to you, Dave. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I had uh, a, a coating on one panel on a car, the car that I have recoated, uh, handed over today, uh, a, a, about four years ago now when I first did it. Um, you know, the coating failed on the roof. Um, and I thought, oh, no, it's clogged. It's, you know, so, something, there's some contamination, something's going on. I'll be able to get that back. Uh, and I couldn't. So, you know, what, and that may, was, may I ask? Dave, was that on the, the freshly painted panel or the, the old panel where it failed? No, no, it was on, on original, that was on original paint. The, okay. the roof and the bonnet has uh, just been repainted on that car seven okay. weeks ago and okay. it's just come okay. back in now, I haven't gassed out. But, okay. um, you know, so I think, I think durability claims there are so many environmental um, yeah. and uh, other factors that to quote durabilities in years is always going to be a challenge i'm going to i'm going to come to andreas very shortly but do you, does anyone know what how they generate these longevity claims and that goes back to what I initially said is there a is there a benchmark testing that we need to do as an industry so everyone knows every product is referenced to that standard how do these companies does anyone know how they make these claims the problem Say is again. they're lab tested, aren't they? Because nobody can yeah. force the lab results or run longevity claims because they're rushing to get the product out. So they can only lab test it um, from what I hear. So mm. as, as, as you know, and I think I've touched before on other podcasts, I uh, look after quite a lot of transporters, as we know. Uh, one of them, uh, being my own, which I've coated and tested, I normally get, if you get a two-year ceramic, let's call it, I would normally get a year to 14 months out of that with a bi-weekly wash. Um, and obviously a loose spray and rinse or a foam applied sealant just to top it up for gloss and for personal because I like to. Uh, yeah, one of the vans I look after, he's a builder. He is a fireman also, and he washes that van with the fire hose because he's a builder, rinses it off, not contact wash. Out of a one-year coating, 14 months. I would only get six to eight months out of a light, personally. Massive variable because I wash, contact wash, yeah. bi-weekly, um, but he doesn't touch it. I don't yeah. touch it. Don't do anything. But bar, rinse it with a high pressure hose at the fire station. And he got 14 months. Yeah, I tend to get around eight. So there's a massive um, gap. There. So again, like you were just saying, mileage. There's too many, you know, variables to call. Uh, 
I mean, ultimately, I think it's not standardized. Some mm -hmm. manufacturers do wash cycle tests, and mm -hmm. then they say, well, in our testing it with the 200 washes. 200 washes, if you wash your car once a month, two, twice a month, or every two weeks or every four weeks, that accounts to that durability time span. Some manufacturers, the serious ones, have weather cabinets in which they put coded panels and they do estimations based on that. Um, those are my dogs now. <laughs> Maybe we need to have a break because my girlfriend is coming home. Uh -oh. Sorry, sorry. Who are the dogs are? <laughs> I think now it's good. No. <laughs> Andreas, can I keep this in? Can I keep this in? We have we, 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 we currently yeah. have ten dogs, so that's that's uh, the side effect. <laughs> <laughs> the Dalmatians. Sorry. <laughs> the Dalmatians. Dave's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I literally put myself on mute because my dog started barking. Uh, <laughs> nothing compared yeah. to that before, yes, I'll tell you that. Uh, all, all that's happened with my spaniel is he's woken up. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm going I'm to leave a bit of this in. I'm going to leave the bit where Dave yeah. nearly wheezes himself and I'll let it, <laughs> it. I'll edit it back in. Leave it all in. So, <laughs> Where were we? Yeah, I don't think there's standardization. Every manufacturer does it differently. And I think they've brought up a very good point. I think the better way of measuring it would be kilometers. Um, uh, Labo Cosmetica does it. Nanolex, I think, does it also. And then there was another positive example. I'm not the biggest fan of Nanolex, but the new Green X paint sealant they brought out. On that label, it says will last up to five washes, which I also think is a more realistic durability claim for most consumers. Yes. Mm. And mm. May maybe, I mean, we all agree on that stuff, right? That time measurements don't make sense. Most manufacturers are unrealistic in regards to the expectations. Maybe the better question is... Why do manufacturers feel pressured to put those yeah, ridiculous good. claims on on those labels? What, that's why it, Andres. Is it? That's it. That is that is that, that is the question. Yeah. yeah, George. I'll come back to you in a second, um, Andreas. Then I'm going to come to Carl. Um, yeah. George. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just touching on what Andreas was saying before, um, it's to sell products, isn't it? Really, because if your product lasts six, twelve, etc., months longer than the next product, until you actually use it. You don't know, do you? So it's kind of a bit of trial and error, really, isn't it, for the user? And that's what I'd say. Yeah, but it doesn't sit right with me. It's like, you know, you'd use the product once. You'd find out the longevity claims, you know, are diminished immediately. Well, not immediately. That's the problem, isn't it? It's not immediately. If it says a year and you get six months, you know, people might second guess and try it again. But there's a long gap in between that. But, yeah, that doesn't sit right with me, you know, when people do that. It, it, Carl, what's your opinion on this longevity yeah. issue? Because we, we, so, we, when we're doing videos together, we, we're constantly discussing it, aren't we? <clears throat> so, yeah, we, we, we obviously we've recently tested a, a brand and we came to look at that a couple of months later. And it, it, to be honest, it didn't perform how I thought it should have performed being that, that age on a, on a ceramic. Um, but uh, funny enough that obviously Dave and Andrea said that in the fact that uh, certain companies, and I noticed that when I was looking into ceramics, that are now starting to do a mileage claim. Mm. Where I think I do think that that's where we need to start going, certainly with the ceramics, certainly with the longer term sealants, because I, I my car itself does pro probably about at least. 2000 miles a month and mm. and so i know from my experience that 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 coating or whatever lsp i'm going to use i'm going to get nowhere near the claim that the company's going to do or to someone who's who's a weekend warrior with their car so mm. i think there certainly has to be massive amount of uh sort of regulation getting being brought into here that all brands and companies are culpable for because 
it, it's ridiculous. Like like Steve said, it's not fair on the consumer. We're we're buying these products under the assumption we're going to get this kind of longevity, and we're not getting that. That that in in regards is false advertising, and therefore Agreed. is wrong. Agreed, Carl. Mm-hmm. And, George, and I mean the, be, the best. So, sorry, sorry, George, go ahead. George, go, and then I'll come back to Andres. Yeah, is it <clears throat> almost impossible though to regulate it because? Even with the mileage claim, some people might go on the motorway more, like you say, Carl, and I know Steve does a massive amount of mileage, but this might just be me being a bit sad. But starting work early in the morning, I'll go down the motorway, no problem. But when I finish work, I'll go back on the A-roads because there's less traffic on the A-roads than there is on the motorway, hence less fallout. Um, Well, most normal people wouldn't do that, and probably not many people do anyway. But And even the way that you wash your car with your wash media, what are you using to clean it? Because yeah. that's going to degrade it. And, yep. you know, even you, 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 you know, if you're using a, a noodle mate or a microfiber mate, it's going to have a different effects. So it's very difficult for a company to put it out there and say it'll last this long unless they stipulate that you use said wash media, said shampoo every so often, you know. That's the issue with it, really. Good one, George. Andreas. And and I mean, Carl said it perfectly. Um, consumers are being, if you're nice, you you say they they are. These claims are, let's say, they are a bit bold. If you're not nice, you're saying it's almost borderline consumer fraud. I mean, the best example of another industry where this all blew up was the the Volkswagen scandal with the, the diesel scandal that they had right because there there is regulation in that industry there is a standardized testing cycle which cars go through and then there there is a measurement of how much co2 those cars put out and vw was was caught cheating on that test and that's the thing that's why i asked the question of why are car care manufacturers feeling forced to put out those ridiculous claims mm. because I think the, the whole industry has moved so close together in, in any other performance category, be it gloss, be it beating, be it cheating, be it, it they're easy to use, that they feel that's the only differentiator they have left when, when the, the, the one coding company says our coding lasts nine years instead of the other ones lasting not eight years then they will gain the, the sales from it. And may yeah. I mean, that's the one thing I think that the IDA or the PVD or both organizations together, um, jointly maybe with other national organizations like that, they would have some sort of leverage on the car car manufacturers where maybe it's possible to develop a standardized testing cycle, which comes up with a very simple like scale of short-term product, mid-term product, <coughs> long-term product, which all car care manufacturers then can use and put on those labels, and then it's an even playing field. May, mm. I mean, I mean, there, there's no other organization on earth which would have even close to the leverage that you guys have. That's You've said that before, Andreas. Andreas came up with that. We, we briefly talked about um, IDA and PVD on a previous podcast, and we talked about this very subject, and Andreas said exactly the same thing. So... <clears throat> um it's it's it, 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 it's a difficult i totally agree with you andres when you say um longevity claims are almost the only differentiator now okay and, and they comp- feel that they, they yeah that it is yeah yeah and in a mass in a competitive market um it's all about usp isn't it, it, it it's ours does something better than mm. yours okay and, and you're quite right yeah. i think the honesty of claims I, i'm not saying brands are dishonest um but there I are there are yeah, yeah. There are some brands that their, their, their claims are blatantly wrong. Um, and I'll come back to the role yeah. of people like myself in terms of doing YouTube reviews. Um, um, should we be even talking about it and all that kind of stuff? Um, um, yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting. What, what are your thoughts on that, Dave, um, about um, maybe um, it's something that the trade organization could, can look at and do you think that brands would welcome that? Because no doubt there are brands out there who know their claims can't be substantiated, so they may may not engage with that process. And you've got other brands 
who would be willing to do that and um, because they they know the the, the the validity claims of their products are robust so what your mm. it's not a committal answer about no, that, no, what your thoughts on that and i suppose that's a compliment to your organization that we're even thinking about yours is and i can't think of anyone else that could um, carry that mantle for the detailing community yeah, yeah i i i'd never I, i'd never considered that in terms of the you know a good use of the trade association so i think the point you make andreas is is really really valuable um i think there might be a bit of a challenge from an ida perspective because the ida um sort of prides itself on being brand neutral um so you know they they're they're, they're very keen being based in america they're, you know very concerned everything has to be double and triple check from a sort of legal perspective because of the litigation culture etc so they're very very sort of, um, focused on being brand neutral pvd not so much um you know pvd is just in the uk so it, a little bit more relaxed um i think it's a really really good um opportunity to to progress with this and and i i think it's a snowball effect i think some brands will be very skeptical and very nervous of getting involved some will say yeah we're up for it you know test us let's let's go through this properly and professionally and then once a few jump on board it'll be a snowball effect um it might be a bit of slowly slowly catching the monkey but you know i think it's a good a good way forward i think i think yeah. the spin-off yeah. benefit will be exactly the same as where there's a um there's a, a benefit to um being associated with pvd and and people knowing it's got these detailers have gone through that that process okay there's a quality control measure there i think that'll bring kudos potentially looking forward if it ever did happen kudos to the brands that they you know can you imagine on their label let's just say look in the future pv you know longevity claims um you know endorsed by pvd and stuff like that it's exactly. a yep. it, it, yep. it's, it's exactly the same benefit at the moment yeah. there's nothing there's absolutely yep. nothing really, really, if, yeah if a brand says it's a year the brand says it's a year uh, uh, you know what i mean um and the beauty of maybe one organization like pvd doing it it's the same test that they will all go through yeah it's yeah. a level yeah. up. under it's the same up. circumstances yeah yeah exactly and if pvd make people aware of what that testing process is okay people like myself who then go and test it can go to the pvd what is their testing criteria it all marries up doesn't it it all marries up in terms of credibility and um, if if the brain brands then can use your label that opens up a whole different income stream for you absolutely mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah george i was just going to say the harshest test to put any product through is the scratch and shine how many times can it go through without it degrading <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how much wash can it take yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. just I mean, um, be a on, fantastic chance for for your organization to actually do something which i think the whole industry would benefit from absolutely and yeah, i mean to, yeah. to 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 add to what you said about the ida and uh, that's one of the heavy hitter questions i i wrote down before the podcast um, so if you don't feel comfortable answering it um, just tell me um in regards to conflict of interests, I mean, if, if you look at who runs the IDA, who, who runs the PVD, um, some of the persons are interlinked with brands, may, some brands are sponsors of the, the organizations. Do you think that both organizations are actually free of any conflicts of interests or because that's that's also another criticism you hear a lot and read a lot in the detailing groups uh, when it comes to the ida mainly the ida um well how independent is it really if that and that and that person is on the board of directors representing clearly representing one brand so um I, my earpods are about to die so i might i will answer this question but i'm gonna have to just go into my settings and put it on my speaker on my phone so if i cut out i'll, I'll make sure i do that um one of the, the the first item on every board meeting agenda with the ida is um declarations of uh any conflict of interests or sort of antitrust stuff so you know we all get the agenda like any other board meeting or, or proper structured committee meeting in advance 
and all parties are asked to declare any conflict of interest to step out of the meeting if they feel that there was a conflict and all of the other board members can can speak up and challenge so <clears throat> for example when i first went on to the board for the ida which was in uh, january 2023 um I took over the day-to-day -day running and ownership of PVD in February of 2023, the following month. I went to the IDA board and said, look, I am now, I now run and own PVD, which is a trade association in the UK. If the IDA have a, a concern about that and, and anybody thinks it's a conflict of interest, I will step back. You know, I don't want to cause uh, the, the IDA a concern or an issue. And I just want to get it out in the open. Um, and, you know, they, they were all fine with it. They said, it's about working together for the for the greater good of the industry, guys. So, you know, th does it really matter? You all, you know, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Um, so, you know, if there is a specific, I think that's one of the reasons why the IDA is so keen on maintaining brand neutrality. If, you know, if there is a board member or a, you know, president or vice president in a in a leadership position that is a supplier member that works or is employed by a certain brand that they they don't comment or they abstain from any conversation or discussion that might become a conflict we're, we're really make you know they're very very strict on it so i mean in in regards to to that idea we had about the ida or the pvd doing durability testing and labeling i mean that it's more a personal question to you do you think that if the case comes up that a brand is caught cheating that is a sponsor of the ida or the the pvd or is represented even in the board by any person do you think that would go through or do you do you think well, maybe it will be held back um do you know one one of the well the, <laughs> I mean, it's a hypothetical not, question but i'm not sure mm. i'm not sure whether for my sins i've done the right thing but for 2024 i've been asked by the current ida global president a guy called shad stoker to um chair the ida ethics committee for this year so if there is an ethics complaint um then that comes to me and two other committee members that basically carry out the for want of a better term the investigation and any disciplinary process and i and i think he's asked me because my my background before i turned a hobby into a business and became a detailer was i was in hr my background's in industrial relations and human resources oh, i used to negotiate with the trade unions uh and i spent some time you know, as a trade union official for, for some years. So, um, you know, there is there is a process. Um, that's the, the sort of straight off the bat answer. I think if there was um, some evidence of any wrongdoing, then, you know, it needs to be taken seriously because otherwise it's the industry as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and oh, that's good. My earpieces have died, but it's gone straight to uh, Mike, so I can carry on. So you know, and yeah. and actually, the ethics committee process. Um, I mean, I don't know about twenty twenty five because you know the the committee's changed, but certainly this year for twenty twenty four, it would it would it would come to me, um, and and we would deal with it as appropriate. Um, so I've just uh, I've just chaired a chaired a ethics committee uh within the ida for you know a couple of issues that have uh been been raised um from people that are outside the ida some yeah. some non-ida members have, have raised a couple of issues and i uh, and i've had to investigate it i'm interested in in sorry to interest in your opinion again dave here because everyone in this room apart from yourself does does reviews um do you think it's right that um people like myself, Steve, Carl, George and Andreas uh, do these reviews and quest publicly because it's on video publicly critique question um, challenge brands. Do you, do you think it's 
it's a, a something that we should be doing. I, I, I you know, I, I sometimes question that. You know, I'm always conscious of when I do a brand review and I that I can't substantiate um, as to whether it's my place to do that. Bearing in mind some small brands, it's their bread and butter, it's their income and everything. Um, you know, not so much the larger brands, uh, but, but the, the argument suits both. Do you, do you think it's right for people like myself to maybe challenge a, a claim or should it be whereby a claim's made, um, it should be robust and upheld? What's, what's, well, um, in fact, know, I'll, I'll come to you, Dave, but what's, what's everyone's opinion on that? Because it, it's something I, I battle with all the time. And this does not lead me towards do a positive review because I do um, challenge stuff, but I'm very cautious of how I present that challenge because I know it's someone's business. Um, where do we stand on that? I, I can give you my my view mm. straight straight off the back of that. You know, there is a lot of, I guess a bit like Andreas was saying, that, you know, we see some challenging contributions from people on social media about the trade associations. We, we also see challenging contributions and comments from people in this industry about reviews. Um, yeah. You know, of course, yeah. that person's going to say, you know, five-star review, it's an exceptional product because they are, a brand ambassador or they they've been sent the product for free or they you know uh, have been paid by the brand or whatever it might be so i think yep. genuine honest you know raw end user reviews uh for products uh in our industry is a good thing that's my view i i and you know i think it's i think it's refreshing because if you don't do the review mm. somebody else could there's nothing to stop mm. any member of the public buying a product and posting a review. That's the nature of the world that we're in now, whether that be on, you know, uh, in, in a written type review or whether it be in a video type review. Uh, there's so many platforms and media out, mediums out there now. Um, you know, anybody can, can mm. carry out what they think is a review and say whatever they like. So it's better to have, I think, uh, you know, a, an unbiased, raw approach to it. Mm. And what are your thoughts on that? Maybe to, Hang on, to, close the, the, to close the circle, um, when Dave invited us to do the PVD test, maybe that also advances the industry if, if reviewers are motivated to do those tests in order to validate their skills, um, the, the reviews video become more credible, right? Because mm. then everybody knows that we actually know what we talk about. Um, we have the same knowledge, um, the, the same the same baseline of mm. knowledge as the professional detailers do, and that maybe also advances the industry because it separates mm. the the bought reviews, the paid for reviews, the the amateur reviews from the, the proper ones. Mm. What what are, what what are the thoughts? We're getting juicy now. What uh, what, what in in terms of who do, you, who do you think is the best person to do these reviews? Do you think professional detailers are the are people potential buyers should be listening to who are using these products daily? In, or do you think... And the second part of my question is, um, you know, the, the wax stock, the, the work on the stage and everything. You know, it, it's, it, there's some fantastic YouTubers that go up on, on stage, Steve's being one of them, and sharing their time and their knowledge and everything. Should that be people enthusiasts or should that be professional detailers on that platform who should people be listening to because i've had the reason why i asked that question is i've had private messages saying and steve might have had them george and carl and andreas you know why should we listen to you you're not even a professional detailer you know why should you be doing this you know and i I, I, I start. I sometimes defend myself by saying, "Well, a professional detail is probably using the same products all the time. They're probably using the same brand." An enthusiast like Steve, geeky detail reviews, with testing a variety of brands. We're going into the nuances of brands. We're testing claims. A professional detail will not be doing that. They'll be do, trying to do it as quick as they can. But what, what are people's opinion on that? Um, um, that's me, my juicy question. Uh, so I was just going to say, if I'm doing a review, I think my product-based review questions that I've set myself uh, is now I think around 32 questions um, when I'm doing a, you know an actual review uh, shall we say whether that's testing slash review um, which have taken a long time to build those certain questions paint color humidity whether you know what time it is what time of day humidity all these things come into you know into question 
and I think you just touched on it. If a guy's, you know, a professional, yes, he will be using lots and lots of products. But mm. I try and bench myself against 60 or 70 products that I've used, tested, and collected the data from, and not only used once, which is what I think I have to, I'd like to share more is. I don't just test one product once. Um, if somebody sends something out to me to test it, we'll be testing in different scenarios, different colors of paint, different vehicles, work vans, cars, wherever it may be. So to give me a broad range of knowledge on that review to test the claims on the products and everything else. Whereas mm. again, not to <clears throat> slap a professional detailer off like Dave, but he's probably got his brands. He probably uses those and sticks with those products and knows them inside out. And he knows how good mm. they are. So he probably uses that as his benchmark. Whereas I'm using mm. a different set of questions um, or different reviews of previous products that really stood out where I've put, which I don't share, or maybe I have shared sometimes, you know, I've got a set of benchmark products and, you know, Bill mm. Hamber or Garrett's Therapy and uh, Infinity and uh, Labo Cosmetica, mm. ADBL, these are ones that regularly come up. So they've got to be doing something right. And, and obviously the end of it, the user experience will probably have a massive sway for me because I'm not a professional or doing it day in and day out. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, I mean the the the, the vi few videos me and Carl probably I'm reading your mind, Carl. Me and me and Carl did a vid um, did videos, and right at the start, um, uh, and, and I'll be honest, Carl, Carl, he didn't question going on video, but he, he, you know, we were doing a review of a product, and I've got twenty twenty five years of doing this kind of not, not the videos, but cleaning cars and sh polishing all that kind of stuff. Carl, pretty much new to it, and there was that conversation between the two of us. You know, should I really be? going on video and doing a review and i said yes that's the beauty of it you've got who's sharing their emotions their user experience having just gone into detailing you've got someone who's been doing it 20 30 <coughs> years and i think that brings value and that's the realness to the videos yeah. um carl what are your thoughts on that? I, don't, I don't want to speak for you but that's, that is a conversation we had yeah so we, we had that conversation but we, we look at it that the majority of people probably about i would say 90 plus percent of the people that are going to be watching uh the, the the reviews on youtube or 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 on insta with steve or anything like that majority of those are going to be enthusiasts okay so they want to know what that user experience is like they they, they want to know our, our emotions about using that and, and 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 what other information we can get but we have to be truthful okay because yeah. at the same point those people may well be buying that product on how we value that product and if we're mm. making a false, if we're being false with our with our review, we are aren't we just as bad as the brand? Exactly. Yeah. And, so, yep. and and so we have a responsibility. Whether thirty plus years with Steve, yourself, Andy, with uh, a lot of years cleaning cars, and myself, brand new into it, we all hold that responsibility of being truthful on camera. Now, mm. we can do it in various different ways. We can be polite in our in our manner and and and, and critiquing that said item or we can be brutally honest i think there has to be sometimes a bit of both because sometimes products perform so poorly that we we have to we have to mention that yeah. uh, yeah. we do hold responsibilities with reviews because those people are going to make a choice from that and and yeah. i think that's a huge huge thing we have to take when we do that I think Harry, Harry, Harry Housewife pointed out he did a video or a comment about a month ago, um, and he openly said, this is just my, my video, and he actively encouraged people to go out and, and get a full flavor, three, four, five uh, videos, which I think is good. As you said about your level of experience or knowledge, uh, mm. I know you, you've known you for quite some years now. Uh, you dive like I do and can't help it. I'm just, why is that though? And why would that happen if this happened? And, and why? And why? And going back to the critique, I, I don't publicly say that's horrendous, that's rubbish, because it's my mm. opinion on my variables. But what I do do is share my variables and my opinion mm. back to the brand. And whether they take mm. that as good criticism or not, then that's mm. down to them. But, yeah, that, that's my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts, Andreas? Who's the best to do it? I mean, you you... You get you, you get a, a bit of um, criticism for the let's say yeah. the honesty of your views, um, and we've already discussed at the start that I think we we need that honesty. Okay, um, how how do you deal with it? What do you you know? 
you know, I, as, as soon as I see your post, I, you know, I, I go and dive into it because I'm always interested in the reactions and everything. How do, how do you deal with that, uh, not aggressive, that that sort of negative spin on you just trying to be brutally honest to Brabham? I mean, because I, most of the time you haven't got vested interest in saying something's good or bad. It's just a product that you've reviewed for the sake of reviewing. Exactly. How, exactly. how, 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 how do you in, um, sort of compartmentalize that? How do you get around those issues? I mean, I mean, for, for a start, it's it's a natural reaction, right? If if you are a reviewer or tester who is direct and honest and brutally honest, um, then you will get brutally honest responses. That's that's just a natural reaction. So I'm I'm fine with that. I mean, the thing is, and to go back to your original question, I take quite a lot of pride in my testing because I think it's very thorough. And if you are very critical, if you are very direct and sometimes brutal in your criticism to brands, then your testing needs to be proper. And the the one thing I was just thinking about the whole time when when you guys talked is maybe if if we demand more honesty and and stuff like that from brands, we should also demand it from ourselves. And that's maybe another chance for the PVD and the IDA to also offer accreditation testing of reviewers and testers that's that's maybe a completely different field because there are there are many testers and reviewers out there and and once again i think it would only advance the industry and help to create more credibility of of testers like ourselves maybe maybe mm. we should do that and we should also go through the the same testing that the professional league tailors go through yeah I think that that would be a good thing. I hope idea. that answers your question, Andy. Absolutely, that was it. Yeah, absolutely, and, and loving those suggestions, Carl. So moving on from what Andrea says, because actually there is some some real thought into that, and 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 the reason I, why I'm thinking this is because if we if reviews had an accreditation into their their processes and everything that we do tested, that means brands have a a, an avenue to go to uh, and people to go to that are accredited uh, reviewers and testers that can get they know they're going to get an honest factual review on that product so like you said it's only going to benefit that the whole of the detailing business so that, I think that, 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 that's definitely got basis on that that needs to yeah the caveat on that is that needs to come from an independent body such as pvd if you see what i mean Absolutely. because as soon as you can yeah yeah no, you can, completely agree and that's why I've that's why I've invested my time and money into UK Detailing Academy for my training because yep. there's no pushing brands. There is, yep. in fact, when we went to our recent one, um, Rich didn't didn't mention a brand at all. Yeah. It was all the theoretical aspects of paint correct process yep. going into the science of it. There's no mention of brands, so there's no yep. spin off yep. from it at all. Um, and I think if we're looking at what Carl suggests, it needs to be from an independent organization such as UKD, yep. P PVA, IDA, and all that kind of stuff, Carl. And that's what I'm trying to say is if, if PVD or IDA had a reviewer's mar uh, section to their to the accreditation, those brands can go to those lists on the IDA or PVD to get accredited reviewers. That's that's where I was pushing that, that thought process to. Yeah. So they that's can get into independent. Yeah, that independent yeah. review yeah. of their product. Mm. Yeah, because to, to answer your question, Andy, I don't think it it doesn't matter who, if if you are an independent tester, a weekend warrior, professional detailer, an IDA member, or any anyone else. A proper test is a proper test, and I think the that's what that's what differentiates a good test and review from a bad one is the the testing principles does he had and it's it's not rocket science right you need you need reference sections you need products to compare them to you need to make sure as steve does that you have your your circumstances in order and you actually mention what the circumstances of your testing were is it hard water you use is it soft water what what is the weather like when you do durability tests and stuff like that and and i think mm -hmm. That's what differentiates a good tester from a bad one, not his profession um, mm. or his background. Yeah, well, I might spend, uh, for instance, let, let's call it testing some sealants. At one point, uh, a few years ago, I tried to test 20 sealants. Yeah. After two days, I'd got through, I think, 10 all weekend. 
So um, now I split it down and do it normally in groups of four, just to test four ceilings, for instance, with some contact tests and recording yep. all the, the data. Yep. That yep. would because take me the... around four to six hours. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it. that's, I mean, we, you, you guys maybe be, or probably can um, confirm that. The sad reality of big group tests is a very, very, very small group of people likes those and watches those but the majority of people don't care about the big group tests. What they type in, in in their YouTube search is one particular product and they want to know about one particular product. Those reviews get a lot of views and the, the big ones usually are, don't get that I'm much. Note, I'm noting this down. But going back <laughs> to try and bring this back. More views. No, right, the, Carl, the, the, the big, the big no comparison tests take an incredible amount of time, as Steve just yeah, said. They, they cost an incredible yeah. amount amount of money. As soon as you drop that video, there will be three comments saying, why was that product not included in the test? So yeah. you <laughs> lose on all fronts. With Every time. Test, you lose on all fronts. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. It's a sad yeah, no, yeah. But we're going back to uh, what we're talking about, regulating the community and stuff in the bottles. Not one product yet that I've tested has met the durability <laughs> claims. Yeah. Not one. That's, that's exactly with us with the waxes we've done. Not one has hit has hit it. I've only ever had one product that got <clears throat> very close, or shall we say, um, and I don't want to sound like a fanboy here, but I think that Andreas knows, and I've talked about it before, I was one week off of uh, a durability claim for the Infinity Wax Synergy Wax. It's the only one that was nearly there, but I had to call it one week short. It's the only product I think has ever got close. And that was on mm. one of my vehicles under my conditions. So, yeah. yeah. That's it. Mm. That's it. So, so, Dave, do you do you think that – I mean, you are in the position to answer that question. Do you think that the IDA or the PVD actually – has the traction and has the importance to do something about that uh, product claims, which are a bit bold and out there to do something about or against that? I think, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, I go back to my comment about is the snowball effect. I think, you know, we will get some, I mean, P start at the beginning, PVD. Yes. I think it has the scope to do that. Um, Resource wise, you know, PVD in terms of its administration and its day to day running, it's just me. So I would need to link in with, you know, guys like you, uh, probably the UK DA, you know, rather than uh, yeah. you know, branded detailing academies that are promoting their own brand, you know, an independent um, group of people to work with me on that because I can't do it single handedly. But PVD with, with that sort of support, yes. The IDA, um, you know, I, I'd need to discuss it within the IDA because they are, you know, very keen on making sure that they're brand neutral and, you know, all that, all that sort of good stuff. Um, but I think, I think the, the, the conversation, the way this conversation has gone around, you know, regulation of durability and longevity claims with brands um, and the proper testing techniques and processes can be linked in together i think mm. that's one whole project you know yeah i mean part of me says whether you're an enthusiast uh or, you know a weekend warrior an enthusiast a, a, a professional detailer you know listen to everybody take what you mm. like and leave the rest because you know there, there's 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 lots of good good points out there and there's lots of things that you won't like and just don't criticize it just scroll past, you know, if you're on mm. Facebook equivalent, you know, lis listen to it. If you like mm. it, take it. If you don't, leave it. But I do think proper robust testing is, you know, a really key important feature yeah. of, um, you know, any sort of regulation around around durability claims from, from brands. And I think mm. some will be very keen to jump on. They will be shouting from the rooftop saying, yes please me i want to be part of that i mean if you look at um you look at the science that um some brands are very happy to yeah. publicly share you know labo yeah. for example yeah. you know the way that they're very happy to share 
the detail behind the science, you know, they'd be saying, yes, please, I'm sure. And others will say, yeah, me, me, me. And some will be a bit concerned, a bit, you know, a bit taking the back seat. But eventually, if 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 it if it grows and the and the concept works, they will want to come be part of that snowball rolling exactly. rolling down the hill. And if, if you're mm. talking with your IDA colleagues about it, um, just tell them, isn't that the most extreme form of brand independence if you actually critically independently test their claims and call out the ones, the black sheep? Mm. Yeah. That's the most I, I extreme think you form found of brand independence. I think, I think and the, volunteering for president of that. Uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> talking about you know uh, challenges within the IDA um, the, the slight challenge is the IDA uh, as a trade association is vast because it, yeah. it's got members in it's global so yeah. mm. let me just give you a quick a quick example um, I, I chair a task force within the IDA called the industry standards task force um, and we've done loads of glossaries and terminologies on detailing terms, chemical terms, equipment terms. Um, we've just done um, some stuff on marine detailing and motorcycle detailing. We've just we're in the final stages of concluding a project a project on um, orders of operation. So basically, what we know and love in the UK is the safe wash process up to and including chemical decontamination that's it right but we've done a global survey to ask people to order the steps that they go through in a safe wash up to chemical decon globally so you know in norway for example not in norway they will do a tar removal stage before a contact wash And that's not wrong. You know, we do a tar and glue removal stage after a contact wash in the UK, generally. But mm -hmm. the amount of tar that we're removing from a vehicle service surface in the UK is very, very different to the amount of tar that is removed from the surface in Norway. Yeah. So they don't want to contaminate their wash mitt with tar. So yeah. they will do a tar removal stage before a contact wash. That's not wrong. It's just a global variance. So... When you look at um, durability claims and the number of brands and products that are available globally, in the IDA, that is a massive, massive task because it's international. Mm -hmm. You might have to take it a chapter at a time and maybe start with the UK and maybe the IDA UK and PVD can work together on it. And then we can grow mm -hmm. from there. That'd make an interesting podcast. We might... Well, we might all over <laughs> we might, dave we might have to do a podcast on that because i just you, you know the differentiations between um wash processes around the world i think is a mass massively interesting subject i mean case case, case important although it's on a small smaller scale i used to always do my fallout okay after my contact wash i've started now doing it before the contact wash you know what i mean and talking we could, to different I, people and everything so we um, could invite reggie from lava cosmetica <laughs> to that podcast because He does the, the trainings for Labo worldwide, and he, yeah. believe me, he has stories to tell which are crazy in that respect in regards mm. to washing routines, polishing routines, um, because there are countries in which you can forget about the safe washing techniques we have or we think are right. You can just yeah. forget about it because they don't have the tools, they don't have the chemicals, they don't have the water. They, they, they have to work out some techniques which we would think are crazy, but they work for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant and, podcast. And, uh, that was really awesome podcast. That, um, so, you know, to do a fallout stage, um, you know, immediately after a contact wash, some would say, no, you got that wrong. It's <laughs> the wrong order. You do a tar and glue removal stage first, you know, tar before fallout. Yeah. But actually, you might want to do, in, in certain scenarios, depending on the contamination on a particular vehicle, you might want to do a fallout stage before a contact wash, but then rinse it without contact, then do a contact wash, and then do a fallout stage again. That's, Dave, that's exactly what we There's did on the last... 
Yeah, that's I, I exactly what we goes, did on the last YouTube video. Yeah. We did it twice it before the contact to, and after the end. It, it goes down to... Oh, it, it's, it, and its contamination will, will direct you, it, its own process. You yeah, know, there's a, yeah. a suggested process, but actually it can vary. Yep. Yes. Well, you got you got to talk about cars. You you could be washing like you, you're saying, Dave. You could be washing a car that's you, you've only washed about a month ago. So actually, your decontamination phase, certainly your chemicals on, will be very different to a car that maybe hasn't been washed for over a year. It, you know, it's always dependent on the vehicle, and and I yeah. think that's that, that's a that's a big basis of how no, you no, no. test that vehicle prior to you, prior to you doing doing any of your wash of faces course. yeah and you know we talk about tar and glue removal as a, as a solvent chemical to remove you know that that contamination we talk about um you know fallout remover but you know for me a hard water lime scale water spot remover is another key part of a chemical decontamination Mm. We forget yeah. about that a lot of yeah, people. Doesn't get mentioned. About that doesn't get mentioned doesn't don't it? rub it in, Dave. You don't need it down there in Cornwall. Come on, <laughs> stop it. We do an answer. Yeah, we You're just showing off it. now. <laughs> no, you I, I, tears I, down there. I used it today um, on a new car protection after my the car that I coated and, and went out. I, a new car protection come in uh, today for for the rest of it, and it's. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what that journey was from production line to to the dealership, but you know, brand new car, it's got. I had to get water spot remover out because it's got hard water all over it, lime yeah. scale. Mm. And I mean, that's the, the, that's the perfect example of what you said earlier in the podcast, which is, it's a lifelong learning process, right? Labo Cosmetica, yeah. I think, were the first ones introducing these acidic or sour shampoos in order to. To get the lime scale off before that no one was talking about that and it, it's a very recent development in in the detailing industry and it doesn't matter if you have been doing it for 10 20 30 or 50 years um if, if you're not open to learning that you have been missing on that very important part of the detailing evolution i would say and, uh, yeah. definitely yeah yeah absolutely absolutely very good example right then i'm <laughs> i'm to the time so i'm just going to go around um steve always does a wrap up and everything um i'll have my say as well um andreas have you got anything that you want to say on regulation do you want to say a wrap-up statement or anything because we've discussed quite a lot i'm just interested um whether we've <clears throat> changed our perception after a couple of hours of chatting um uh, everyone an opportunity to have a final a final say i mean as to where we go with with regulation <clears throat> the beautiful the beautiful thing for me is that the the whole podcast it, it rounds up like a circle. Um, Dave started with the phrase that the whole idea of the PVD and the IDA is to advance the industry, to further the industry, to make it a better place. That's exactly what we as testers and reviewers are trying to do. And that's exactly, I think, um, if, if I'm interpreting that right, everything you just said in the podcast, um, maybe that will happen in the future that the IDA and the PVD is picking up the idea of regulation or trying to implement certain processes, certain, uh, certain further testings and stuff, which helps us in getting that regulation in place or helps us in as testers and re reviewers to get better as testers and reviewers and as persons because we are now... Um, we'll do that that PVD entry level um, theory test and let's see if, if we actually know what we talk about. That's that's my takeaway from this podcast. It's it's all all we try and it doesn't matter if it's the brand, if it's us, if it's the the PVD or the IDA. All of us are trying to make the industry a better place and it's actually happening. It's it maybe is a small step here and there, but it's actually happening and it's tangible. Beautiful. Thank you, Andres. Really? Dave. Um, well, the the only thing I, I I would like to add is that it's something that we talked about when we met at UKDA for the first time that we haven't had the chance to touch on tonight. But it's probably a whole another podcast for another day. But one yeah. of the things that I'd also like to work on is thinking about the future uh, people coming into our industry, and you know I would really like to see detailing as a as a topic in its own right on the uk apprenticeship scheme 
Um, yeah. So you know, at yeah. the moment, you can go into a detailer uh, as an apprentice on the back of a social media videography type course or a customer service type course or a bookkeeping invoicing type course. And you can do a bit of detailing on the side, uh, but you are measured in your apprenticeship against your core subject. I would love to see detailing as a core subject in its own right. And, uh, you know, that's a, a whole nother project that I need to need to think about getting some traction on because that's the really future nice. of our industry. Very similar day. idea to what the Germans have. I can tell you that. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I'm 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 getting quite emotional. That was beautiful, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that was spot on. That was spot on. In fact, both of what Andreas and David said so far is um it's it's what we, it's the mindset we're all in um and i think that's that's a really positive and i'm, I'm gonna link into what you two have just said when i have my, my say in a second carl <clears throat> i don't think there's much more i can add i i i've really actually enjoyed this conversation i've enjoyed yeah. understanding the ethos of pvd and rda um i've really enjoyed obviously hitting this regulation whether it we within the professional industry or we, obviously talking about brands and actually that that thought that andreas had about pushing the testing independently and having maybe some pvd and rda back in um whether that be uh, registration with them as testers i think there's definitely got to have some some legs to it um so yeah i don't think there's much more we can i, I can add to that i th i've thoroughly enjoyed this yeah, I mean, we've been going for quite a long time. Um, I mean, uh, you know, it's getting late, so we're going to wrap it up very, very shortly. But I could, I could talk about this for hours. Um, I'll add my set, then I'll come to Steve for his his wrap up, and then Steve always gets to just give us a final thing of what's coming up. Um, <clears throat> the thing I've I've noticed is, uh, first of all, I've been looking forward to doing this for a long time. Um, and I, the thing I've noticed is at no point have any of our suggestions regulation been about making money or advancing a brand have you noticed the rhetoric that we've all talked about is advancing the industry it's about the credibility of our professional detailers it's about the credibility of people that are doing reviews it's all about betterment of the industry um and that is really refreshing that wasn't unprompted there was no script to this podcast at no point have we talked about money and talk about uh, you know about enhancing business it's all about the people in the industry and um, the perception of the industry from people looking in Dave mentions a great point about um, expanding this in industry into an apprentice scheme and all that kind of stuff. And Andreas labors the point that, um, you know, not blowing sunshine at your ass, Dave, but, you know, in terms of a potential regulatory body, you've all we've got, you know, uh, and the idea, that's all we've got at the moment. Okay, I can't think of any other independent organization that can um, take on this baton of advancement for, for the industry. And, and that was really nice. Um, you guys are all. Yeah, we is have. That, is, yeah. Well, is, 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 exactly. The hearing. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you know, you've talked about the ethics and all that kind of stuff. And I love the fact that there's an, an ethical body embedded within your organisations you work for as well. Um, I think that's fantastic. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm a great believer on the accreditation piece. Um, um, so it's, it's I, I like the way this conversation naturally went. Uh, my final part is this is just hopefully a start of a conversation. And like I said, um, we tried to justify our feelings. Okay, this is all about. Um, I welcome people to comment sort of down below um, and carry on this conversation how we can better the industries. If you want to mention brands, you can. But this is not what this podcast is about. This is about regulation to make the industry more credible in terms of it holistically and also the people within it whether that's professional detailers or reviewers and all that kind of stuff so um for all of you i thank you for the contributions that'll be really interesting to see what conversation we have below um and no doubt we may visit this in the past uh, in the in the future regarding future podcasts so thanks to everyone steve your final thoughts and um your normal wrap-up piece and then we'll play the pro well i thought i'd throw a spanner in the works right at the end in the comments for people to get in below would be how many identical products would we have to test? Oh, stop it. We didn't even go there, did we? <laughs> we Oof. didn't go there. I, I wrote it down and I danced around it and then we went off on another tangent. But how could you test something? And maybe if you tested it, maybe it's different dilutions or the scent or it's out by 0.01 mil. 
because the white label had changed? Oh, I don't know. That's food for thought. Let's get in the comments below. Yeah. Um, and let's hear everybody else's thoughts. Well, for Andrea, Love it, definitely. Mm. I'm, no, I'm so, looking so, so forward Andrea. to that theory test. <clears throat> we all do that that uh, PVD theory test, and then uh, let's do a podcast discussing our results. I'm yeah. looking yeah. so forward to that. Yeah, I think yes. that would yeah. definitely yes. a great one. idea. And it will, as you say, It'll be the end of the start of our careers. <laughs> Dave, Dave, <laughs> would we do the PVD and the IDA theory test? Would that be a possibility? Um, well, the PVD one, I can, I can set you all up. You know, yeah. any, any, if we all do it, uh, or you know, just some of you want to do, it, I can do that. I can set that up for free because that's within yeah. my control. Okay. Um, you know, normally there'd be a, a, a charge for that, but obviously, the, you know, you guys won't be paying for it. So I can set that up and, and set it up on the software we use and, and we can set that up one evening or one day. And I don't, I, that's free. The IDA, I don't have control over because the IDA isn't just me and there is a charge mm -hmm. for it. It's $200. So how, how much so, would, would that be normally for the, for the theory test? For the PVD theory test? No, the, well, the IDA one. The IDA theory, which is the certified detailer, yep. uh, is, is 10 exams in the IDA. Each one's got between 10 and 20 questions, yep. and it's $200. Oh, the PVD oh, is one it, exam, 100 questions. Okay. <laughs> but let's Sorry. start with the PVD one, because I can set that up with you guys, okay. you know, uh, without jumping through any, okay. you know, hoops and, and processes, because that's the beauty of pvd i run it i own it and i can make it happen okay andrea if you don't come first i'm going to be gutted <laughs> <laughs> everyone everyone's let's thinking see. let's see there's everyone's a language thinking. barrier there there's a language everyone. barrier there i always have that excuse so everyone in this but, test you know, is the good thinking thing is, i'm not coming first <laughs> I, I will get all of your feedback which is really valuable to to help pvd develop as well and yep. you know andreas is i'm sure andreas is going to come back and say dave my because andreas's question 37 is going to be different to steve's question 37 because they're they're randomized but andreas is going to come back and say dave my question 37 i think the way in which that's been worded could be slightly different. I think you could put it this way, or you've got these four possible answers. There's a fifth, you know, and that's really valuable <laughs> feedback to help in the whole process, yeah. you know, grow and develop. Yeah. We will review your set of questions. Yeah, the Whether review, we pass or fail, we'll that's a good idea. Definitely let's, sway not my vote. Do, let's not only do the test and a podcast, let's all of us do a video review about the test then. Yes. <laughs> that will be, yeah. that will be that, fun. That, and that, now that could be the start or the end of PVD. <laughs> <laughs> this Dave, this no, test could I'm be the, the end of all of us. <laughs> no, no, I'm really up for that. We're, we're set that up yeah. after, after it's wrapped up. Perfect. Here. Brilliant. Yeah, no, just to wrap up, just to say before thank you, you, you once again, up, Steve, Steve, before you wrap up, just to let you know that the reason why Carl just a coughing fit, he's just private messaged me, is as he uh, coughed, he passed wind. So I thought I'd just share that with you. Uh, before, um, it's just my, my computer went ping and I had a look. That's why I was laughing just a minute ago. Steve, uh, oh, I thought it was you... Steve dog snoring again. <laughs> right. right, Steve, still going. your thoughts? Your does your opinion on regulation change from the start of the podcast to the end? Um, give us a quick flavour of what's going on in your world and the cup of tea, and then we'll uh, roll the end credits. Yeah, no, first and foremost, thank you to Andreas and Dave for turning up. Um, I hope you return again, uh, as always, because it was a really great chat. Well, as you can see by the time, but you probably can't. We're two hours, 36 minutes in, and that we were probably on half an hour before. And I'm sure we'll stay on with Jim Wagon in a second. So, yeah, look, thanks again to everybody uh, for coming on. Uh, a few things from TCB. We've got the barbecue coming up, Dave, haven't we? Uh, uh, UK Detailing Academy very soon. Um, yeah. It hasn't been released yet, but you're hearing it here first. We will be running a Zvisa Day through TCB at the UK Detailing Academy. Um, if somebody follows um, my socials, I've had a meeting with Lake Country um, just last week. Andy was not unavailable and didn't answer my phone, so I missed that meeting. But um, I've had that meeting. We will be Is running um, another introduction free course 
downing the i think they call it gillingham not gillingham so that's down kent way also we're going to be running for the people uh, who live up north another beginner's training day which will to be confirmed on destination but we believe around huddersfield that might make uh is it clean your ride no clean your car somewhere up around there i believe yeah um we will be doing another update there will be other meets and we're doing i will organize a few more caffeine and machine dates um uh, this year and with caffeine and machine opening a few other um new venues we'll try and visit those as well and there's some some others along the pipeline but yeah thanks again gents um quick wax stock. For me. wax stock yes that's just the one day isn't it um yeah. is it 21st yeah 21st yes yeah, the 21st of july yeah just the one day so um yeah if you want to come and see any of us i'm sure dave andreas are you coming to wax stock this year yep let's see about that <laughs> come over andreas if it would be great if you could come over, Andreas. Honestly, you'll you'll be amongst uh, three friends anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. No, it'd be but great. No, it'd be great to see you here. Though. It'd be great to see you here. Thank you as always, and um, I really look You're forward welcome. to the next one. We need to do more of these, gents. Uh, we yeah. should have let's to let's do a next area. one, and um, maybe I can set up the next one by asking one last question to Dave, which you would then have to answer in the next one. If, if a professional detailer would ask you, I only have money for one organization, is it the IDA or is it the PV? <laughs> right, and with that, oh, roll the credit. Oh. You'll have to tune into the next one. I'm going to cut it there because that's a beautiful ending. That's a beautiful ending. Right, I'm going to end recording. <laughs>